we're in this very broken play, a world of a series of not just serious, but quite unique and rather unprecedented disruptions. I don't think we necessarily set a new low, but we could arguably retest those existing lows at some time before the end of the year. Right now, we have five cuts priced into Fed fund futures over the next 12 months. That's a lot. The market is underpricing the risk of the Fed remaining on hold for the remainder of the year. Unfortunately, I think a mild recession is the most likely outcome. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market a bit softer this morning on the S&P 500, negative by 0.3%. We're on PAC Westwatch once again in the pre-market. That is down to about $5 a share in early trading. We're negative by more than 13% and barely squeezed together a day of gains in yesterday's session. Right now, $5.16. We'll come back to that in a moment, Bramo. We need to talk about the lead story later on this afternoon. 4 p.m. Eastern time in the Oval Office, congressional leaders with the President of the United States. And trying to dampen any expectations for that meeting ahead of time. We heard yesterday from Mitch McConnell, we heard yesterday from Democratic leaders, but in particular Republican leadership coming out and saying, we're not going to work miracles here. There's no magic bullet. And so basically saying, stop it with hoping we're going to resolve it today because it ain't going to happen. There are other people in that room at 4 p.m. Eastern time, but we all know it comes down to just two guys, right? Correct. They've got to sort it out. And basically, at this point, this is the question. And Talib Singh of PGM Fixed Income yesterday put it well, formerly of this administration, basically saying, at this point, politicians are looking for the markets to push their hand. They're waiting for the markets to freak out, have some massive sell-off, and then say, we had no choice. We had to have some sort of deal. The market's saying, we've seen this movie before. We don't want to do it. And so as a result, it's making it more likely that we reach the debt ceiling limit, that we actually pass it, that we enter default, because there isn't this sort of pressure coming from markets. How perverse is that? We're playing chicken with the S&P 500. It's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And very frustrating and very exhausting. And that's why a lot of people try not to pay attention to this. And I think the other reason as well, Lisa, they struggle to get an edge. What edge can you have around a story like this, going into a mess like this one later this June? Absolutely none. And that is the problem. It is politics and it is basically this game of chicken that we're playing and we don't really know where the gravity uh, really lies. What we will see later today is perhaps the nodes of some uh, room for some sort of adjustment on either side and whether President Biden comes to the table uh, more sort of willing to negotiate or basically saying a clean debt bill, clean debt limit or nothing. Have you got any confidence with these guys to sort this out? before the X day. Have you got any confidence in Chairman Powell? According to many of you, you don't. This is a Gallup poll released today showing 36% of US adults say they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence that the Federal Reserve Chairman would do or recommend the right thing for the economy. Lisa, 36%. We are talking record low stuff here. Yeah, compared to 37% during her first year uh, with the Fed in 2014. So very much uh, a significant decline I do wonder if this is a Jerome Powell issue or if this is an elected official uh, issue, whether we're seeing in general a loss of confidence with all elected officials just more broadly. And you see that across the board with a decline in confidence that, that any party <laughs> can deal with the economy correctly. Did you not read the scripts that I distributed around the newsroom this morning? Oh. It's a Jay Powell issue. <laughs> yes, Get on the same page, Grandma. <laughs> it's a Jay Powell well, issue. Look, I think that it's important, though, because it means that it's going to become that much more perilous for them to keep rates high if unemployment rates go up. Basically, if you start to see an economy that materially weakens and there's a lack of confidence in Jay Powell to start with, it makes their job that much more challenging just going forward. So I take your point and I do agree. I just was in this poll. You could see all of the leaders just basically have no hey, it's confidence It's pretty low. We talked about ridiculous. Biden's poll, the Washington Post ABC News poll that came out over the weekend. If you're wondering where TK is, he's reading the sleuths. He's still working his way through them. <laughs> Bramo is going to be back with us tomorrow morning. What did you make of that? I thought it was really interesting, not the decline or the tightening in the standards, demand. Or, but the demand side. That's what I find most interesting, because that tanked at the fastest pace going back to 2009. Is this a confidence issue in corporate suites, uh, C-suites across America, or is this a confidence issue by banks that they're going to get the money back? And we're anticipating it's going to continue as well through the year ahead. We'll pick up on that story in just a moment. Just to get you up to speed on the price action this Tuesday morning, good morning to you all just tuning in on TV and radio. This is what it looks like right now on the S&P 500. Negative 
negative 0.3%, barely put together a day of gains to kick things off on Monday. In the bond market, yields coming back about three basis points on a 10-year, 347.48. And hello, Bramo. Wow. Look at that. The euro. Oof. 109.82. We're negative 0.2%. Fireworks over there. Honestly, it is interesting, though, that it's going in the direction that a lot of people weren't expecting, which is dollar strength. Today, the Fed speak that we get includes at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, Fed Governor Philip Jefferson. And then uh, later this afternoon, New York Fed President John Williams. The Fed speak uh, reignites throughout the week. Today, President Biden, as you were saying, 4 p.m. in Washington, D.C., is meeting with Republican leaders Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell. Democratic leaders will also be there, Hakeem Jeffries and Chuck Schumer. They have already dampened expectations and yet perhaps we'll get the contours of what some sort of deal might look like and today earnings continue just to give you a sense we're more than 85 percent of the way through this earnings season and today we have a slew of oil majors duke energy uh, as well as aftermarket occidental petroleum i'm very interested in some of the consumer discretionaries which we get airbnb for example after the bell because uh, our next guest pointed out that three sectors are showing double digit earnings growth in this earnings season including consumer consumer discretionary, which I find fascinating at a time when people are talking about a potential recession. John Stolfus joins us right now, the chief investment strategist at Oppenheimer Asset Management. He is constructive on this equity market. John, Marko Kalanovic at JP Morgan is not. This is what he had to say to start the week. If rate cuts happen this year, it will either be because of the onset of a recession or a significant crisis in financial markets. Marco went on to say the gap between the bond market, equity market and the Fed is likely to close at the expense of of equities. John, why do you think Marco's wrong? Well, for one thing, I think that I think when we look at the market, the market seems to be very confident, both from the October low of last year, on uh, uh, October 12th, uh, as well as on a year to date basis, it seems to be very, very confident that uh, cyclicals uh, are of interest, uh, uh, growth here, uh, uh, value and garfier growth are of interest. Your best performing sectors on a year-to-date basis are communication services up, up, up 23.16 percent on my Bloomberg information technology up 22.7 percent. Consumer discretionary up 14.56. All outperforming the S&P 500, which is up 7.78. Your worst performers are energy, financial, and the Utes, negative 2.57 percent. Uh, you know, I, as you all know, I, I, I've been in the market since 1983, so that's that, that's every boom, bust, and recovery cycle since then. And w there's no doubt about it. You know, we are. You know, we, we've got a situation here where we're coming up with this debt ceiling situation that is significant. But uh, the interesting thing about that, in our view, is we believe it would be political suicide for anybody who takes the the United States over the cliff into any kind of a default. Uh, you know, the last time that we had one of these uh, that I remember we were headed to the uh, – taking it to the limit with, with the politicians, I think it was Warren Buffett uh, got uh, on, on uh, the, the financial uh, – uh, on a financial channel, and he said – you know, he said this would be the first time the U.S. would default in 230 years. This would be a highly offensive thing. I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but he said essentially – and, and all of a sudden, I, I within 24 hours or so, as I recall, it was it was done. They came to an agreement. Every, it was reported in a lot of corners uh, around the market. Well, they kicked the can down the road, but guess what? We did in the fall. Markets went up. We got through that. Yeah. And I think that's what the market is betting on. It's, I think the market is also, and by the way, I, I, I understand what, what you're saying. Fed uh, uh, Chair Powell has a, a bit of difficulty uh, in terms of uh, his communication skills, ironically. I mean, but, but attorneys speak great to attorneys. That's part of his schooling. But sometimes when they speak to the general public, people don't understand them. But I think he's done from – ha from having come from a position of being way behind the yield curve yeah. to now really having cut inflation just about in half with, ten with nine cuts and most recently an additional ten. Let's see how that works. So far, so good. The economy is telling us plenty of jobs. Uh, businesses, as you mentioned, uh, Lisa, with those three sectors, are 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 showing resilience with double-digit earnings. Okay, and and others are are waffling along a bit, you know. But you've you've got you've got an earnings season that is not devastating in a highly challenging environment, which indicates that businesses, having gone through the financial crisis, having gone through the uh, the pandemic, having gone through the post-pandemic, uh, uh, the all the supply chain disruptions. 
all the political unrest in Washington that we've been living and the social problems in big cities, all of this, and they're still, you know, able to make money. And it's natural that earnings are going to decline some in a period like this. Yeah. But it looks like light of the tunnel is not a locomotive, but it's sunlight. <laughs> but it, it, you got to run a gauntlet. John, you're killing me. There. That's a five-minute response to why is Marco wrong. <laughs> Can you imagine well, if Marco's there's... listening this morning? <laughs> what can I tell you? <laughs> well, <laughs> you, just, you guys just, know John. me. You ask me a question. I want to give you a detail. And, and understandable, <laughs> you've been pent up as you listen to all of the bearish proclamations and you're just trying to basically get your point across, which is that all of these things are just wrong. But I do wonder what you make of the fact that there's been such a huge decline in demand for loans, the confidence in the C-suite, how that pairs just quickly with the optimism that you see in consumer spending. I, I think, think what we'd have to say is that uh, the businesses are getting very, very cautious in here in the near term. I mean, there was one point last year where I think uh, there was one, uh, one poll that showed something like 98 percent of, of, uh, of, uh, of CEOs thought there was going to be a recession uh, at late last year at the beginning of this year. Well, so far that hasn't happened. And we waffled through it. And I think what it is is when, when they're concerned, they don't fool around. They they tap down right away, but they're prepared to, to ramp up again. And with an economy that is not analog but is essentially digital, you can you can ramp up remarkably well. It doesn't mean you're you're perfect. You know, you can have all kinds of uh, uh, sluggishness of, uh, uh, moving ahead. I think we get moderate growth out of this thing, but on a relative basis, that's not so bad. You know, and, and we'll have also we'll be away from free money which is what really got us into this situation overall. Uh, it was the pandemic, politicians adding both administrations, a lot of uh, liquidity to the system on top of the Fed. And the Fed is taking all the blame, you know, which is, is, very, is, is very kind of them. But it, it's <laughs> politicians, ultimately, it's the politicos. You know, when we vote, if we don't like what they do, we should get on the phone yeah. and call their offices and have five of our friends tell 10, five of their friends to do the same, and then maybe we'll get somewhere politically. Hey, John, but this meantime, turned into a public service announcement. <laughs> go, I, I love it. I, We're I'm totally on the same page. Get on the, get on right. the phone. Exactly. Get on go the phone. Call your representatives. If you don't hey, like Hey, John, them, thanks for getting on the phone difference. for us this morning. We appreciate it. John Stolfe was there of Oppenheimer Asset Management. I love that. The Fed's taking all the blame. Yeah, call your politician. So nice get on the phone. Tell five friends. Get them to tell five friends. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's running for office. I know, exactly. It's amazing. He's got a band. In the next hour, Kelly Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex. Looking forward to that conversation. Your equity market negative 0.3% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell warns that he has no secret plan to solve the debt limit deadlock. Congressional leaders meet today with President Biden. McConnell says he told the president it was up to him and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to find a solution. At the same time, McConnell predicts the two sides will reach a deal and avoid a default. Vladimir Putin vowed to pursue his invasion of Ukraine, accusing the Kremlin's enemies of seeking to dismember Russia. Putin spoke at the start of the annual military parade celebrating the Soviet victory in World War II. He said that a real war has been unleashed against the motherland. In China, more pressure on the economic recovery that's already been called into question. Export growth slowed last month to 8.5 percent. Meanwhile, imports plummeted almost 8 percent. Economists warn that the strong export figures aren't likely to last forever. Shipments are expected to drop this year. Aramco will introduce an additional dividend, potentially boosting payouts for Saudi Arabia's government by billions of dollars. It comes at a time when weaker oil prices are pushing the kingdom's budget into a deficit. Aramco says the new dividend will be between 50 to 70 percent of the company's annual free cash flow. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think we could see continued stress in the banking system broadly, but very much at the lower end as we work through some of these COVID excesses. I'm not sure that we're out of the woods, but I do think that the big booms have probably been heard.
Great to hear from David Leibovitz there, the Global Market Strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Kicking off your Tuesday morning, good morning, with your price action looking like this. Negatives by 0.36% on the S&P 500. Going into CPI tomorrow, PPI on Thursday, and a congressional leaders meeting with the President of the United States later on this afternoon, 4 p.m., Eastern Time in the Oval Office. Looking at the bond market at 348.24, yields lower by a couple of basis points. Crude breaking down just a touch, negative 0.7%, 72.65. Lisa, we haven't talked about the, inf the import data out of China. Chinese imports breaking down and pretty severely overnight looking at that information. And this goes to something that we've been talking about. Has the recovery been entirely domestic uh, with respect to domestic spending in China? How much is this actually going to trickle out to other economies? And this really does fly in the face of this idea that Japan and South Korea and some of the other regions are going to really see a massive uh, spike up in economic activity as a result of China's reopening. Does that continue? And are we seeing that in oil? Will Kennedy of Bloomberg joining us in about 30 minutes' time to have this conversation. Looking forward to that. Looking at Pac West in the pre market, let's get those numbers on the screen for you. We look like this $5 and about 20 cents in the pre market at the moment. Yesterday, at one point, that stock was up by about 30%. Those gains faded pretty hard going into the close, Lisa. Now, I think we're all on the same page here. Once you get a name down to this kind of level, there's not really that much point quoting the percentage point move because you're up or down 20 percent with some ease. But what we've seen is a lack of a recovery more broadly at the regionals. Yes, you see fluctuations, but it really is still deeply depressed. And yesterday's sleuth, to, to, sleuth. Quote, to quote Tom, the uh, senior loan officer opinion survey, raised questions about profitability more than anything else to me. Yes, you are seeing tighter credit conditions. You're not necessarily seeing some sort of credit crunch yet, but you are seeing a lack of a profitability proposition on the part of banks. Sluice used to be this random thing that you'd talk about, and you'd have to explain what it was. You'd come on out and you'd be like, yes, yeah, so there is this, this survey that the Fed conducts <laughs> of senior loan officers. They give their opinions on what's happening with loan demand and, and lending standards, and people would just be like, yeah, whatever. Then it moved markets yesterday. Well, Remarkable. We said that about the University of Michigan inflation survey sure. and how much that was going to potentially influence things. We've said that about every economic indicator that's become the hot data point, one after another, that suddenly is the data dependency that's a roving target to find what that data is. Are you, Mitch, was always ridiculous. I don't know what chair power was up to there. Gerald Cassidy joins us now, head of U.S. Bank Equity Strategy and large cap bank analyst at RBC Capital Markets. Gerard, wonderful to hear from you again, sir. Can we start with the SLUs, the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey? Gerard, what did you take from that yesterday? Thank you, John, for having me on. And the survey had really not really major surprise, no major surprises. As you guys have been talking about, there was a tightening across the board in most lending sectors. The CNI, which is commercial and industrial loans, that tightening actually eased up a little bit. It was still tighter, but not as dramatic as it was six months ago. Commercial real estate still tighter, as well as on the consumer side. What's interesting, I what really caught my attention was two things. Lost the connection there. Wasn't sure what was happening there. Yeah. But they put me back on camera, so I assume that <laughs> it's back to us. Yeah, I assume Jared that Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets in London. I think we've lost the audio connection to him. Yeah, I just stopped hearing him. So we will try to reestablish that connection and get back to him. But what he was talking about, I know he wrote a note about this, about how consumer credit has actually increased that in terms of demand and in terms of uh, credit creation. Consumers are still borrowing. Corporations, not so much. And I wonder if this is just simply a result of who borrowed most during the pandemic. Corporations stocked up in credit, cheap credit. Consumers didn't so much. So at this point, you start to see a reversal in those trends, which really kind of are the push-pull that we See some pushback from Andrew Hollenhorst on some of this yesterday, basically saying that this could have been a whole lot worse. Was this really worse than anticipated? Wasn't this just a continuation of the trend we saw in the previous slews? <laughs> I can't take you seriously. I can't take anyone seriously when they say sluice after uh, what Tom did yesterday. But I, I, I agree with you, and I did read that Hall and Horst uh, idea. Basically, this is what Jerome Powell said, too. He said this is just a continuation of some of the uh, credit tightening that we saw going back six months. To me, there is a shift. And to me, the fact that Gerard Cassidy is talking about how consumers uh, seem to be continuing to borrow and, and companies don't raises this question. Are companies not borrowing because it's too expensive and they don't feel confident that they uh, have the opportunities to invest? Or are they not borrowing because of some other reason, of something that they see in the economy that potentially is dangerous? Gerard Cassidy joins us again 
from RBC Capital Markets out of London. Hopefully they don't cut off the audio this time, Gerard. Let's continue that conversation on the slews. Elise has mentioned the demand component of that report. Could you build on that, Gerard, whether that's something we should be somewhat worried about? It's a good question. And um, John, as you pointed out, and Lisa indicated and mentioned, the demand was down not only for CNI loans, but for commercial real estate loans. Where we saw a slight uptick in demand was in the consumer side. But the commercial and commercial real estate loan demand continues to weaken as companies start to get a little more cautious about the outlook for their businesses, which is something that's very common at this point in the economic cycle. Is that the right way to interpret it, Gerard? I mean, this is one of the questions as I was looking through the data. Was it that they are not confident about the future, or is it the companies already stocked up in cheap credit? They don't need that much more. They're actually getting plenty of revenues. Why take the expense of borrowing at these rates if they can just sit on their hands and sit it out. We saw this in some of the data in the first quarter GDP that basically companies weren't making a move. They were actually being more cautious than consumers that keep spending. Is this data just a confirmation of that? Lisa, that's a very good point. I would say it's a combination of those factors. One, as you pointed out, during 2020 and 2021, we had record DCM markets, and, and, the, and those companies have plenty of debt on their balance sheet and haven't used it all yet. But I would also say they are getting a little more cautious. And, and also the banks, as the banks enter this period, we have to remember with rates being higher, it's more costly for people to borrow. So that's another factor on the commercial side. So it's a combination of those factors, as you pointed out. Now. Were you impressed by this or basically uh, uh, mildly optimistic about the lack of credit tightening that some people were expecting to see in terms of a rapid decline in the willingness to lend? I, I was, and, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that because sometimes people get over, you know, excited about uh, the credit tightening. It's going to be a credit crunch. Not, not really. And, and the reason being, banks are in the business to lend, as we all know. And now they risk adjust that lending, and they may charge more for loans today. But they're not packing up their bags and not lending. They really have opportunity. If they have real opportunities that, are, on a risk adjusted basis, it makes sense to lend. They will lend. Jamie Dimon points this out all the time on his earnings call that they're in the business to help their customers in good times and in more challenging times. Lend less, though, might be the trajectory from here, though, Gerard. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, that's fair. Oh, definitely. You know, you look at the loan growth, John, last year in the second half of 2022, it was double digits for the banking industry. We're, we're forecasting this year we'll probably get 3 to 4% loan growth. So lending less is a very fair statement. When you look at that report yesterday, just to put a bow on it, Jared, would you say that's a feature of monetary policy and not a bug? I, I think you're right that monetary policy certainly has influenced that. We know the Fed's balance sheet has grown so dramatically. Now they're in QT, and obviously they're shrinking that balance sheet, which is affecting the other side of the bank's balance sheets, which are deposits. So, yes, I think you're right that that is certainly a, a factor there. Great to catch up, Gerard. Sorry about the technical problems a little bit earlier in the conversation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Out of London, Gerard Cassidy there of RBC Capital Markets. I promised you that note from City's Andrew Hollenhorst. This is what he had to say. Rather than a sharp credit crunch, the sluice is consistent with aggregate bank data showing a sustained steady tightening of credit. That's his view. Some people will read that and they'll say, Andrew Hollenhorst thinks that the market is completely underpricing the chance that the Fed's going to even raise rates further and hold them here for a longer period Andrew of time. Andrew would tell you that. Andrew <laughs> would tell you that, yes. Um, he would say that people have really overplayed the bank stress story, and this is just another example of it. Other people will read this data. I've read other reports that say, this doesn't even include the credit tightening that we probably have seen as a result of what we, the SVB and, uh, and, and First Republic. So it really is a tale of how you want to read the data. We get the data and then people explain it the way they want to. So how long do I need to wait for this quarter? Is that like in August? Is that when I get <laughs> the report for this quarter? It's late, yes. Great. Yeah, February was super, the one from Super helpful. Quarter. Yeah. Uh, super, super helpful. Thank you, Bramo. Equity futures on the S&P. <laughs> negative 0.4%. Coming up on this program, Heidi Redeker of the Council on Foreign Relations on the debt ceiling debate. Congressional leaders in the Oval Office with the President of the United States, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll count you down to that event through this morning. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Live from New York City, welcome to the programme on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Just getting some data from a survey. The US small business sentiment from the NFIB survey falling in April to the lowest level in a decade. That one comes back in. But here's an important piece of it. Loan availability. The survey suggests there was not a material change in credit conditions for small businesses in the month. In fact, the measure, according to our reporting here at Bloomberg, and thank you, Reed Pickett, for putting this together so quickly, the availability of loans actually improved somewhat. Now, bear in mind that it was at a decade low, Bramo, in March, but it didn't get worse. And I think a lot of people were looking to this survey for some information around that story. It didn't get worse, according to this. What it does show is just this massive divergence that we see in uh, in what we see for the business environment for large companies and small companies. And this is just confirming it, which possibly is only exacerbated by regional banks withdrawing credit. But that's not the driver. And that's the interesting thing. There is something else going on that's leading to a decline in confidence. Less than one in five firms said they're planning capital outlays. What do you make of that? They're not investing. Well, so is this because they see uh, some dark clouds in the horizon or a recession coming? Is this something that they're seeing in the actual economy? Or is this just because the media put out you know, these ideas of recession and they're too gloomy and so they're not necessarily being optimistic enough? I sense from enough. the tone of yours you well, don't believe it's that. I, I don't know whether that is the truth, but we saw this again and going back to the GDP report, we saw a lack of confidence, a lack of investment, a lack of pulling the trigger on deals from uh, some of the corporate executives, but consumers are still spending. So where is the reconciliation? What are they seeing that the rest of us aren't seeing as clearly, even though, yes, profits are declining pretty much across the board? You've got levels and then you've got change. Only a net 3% of respondents said it was a good time to expand, which sounds absolutely dreadful. <laughs> yes. But it is better, better than the previous month because the previous month was the smallest on record. It kind of tells you where we're at. This goes, though, to the idea that it's still a tight labour market, so they still have to pay up for labour. Inflation is still hot and people have less money to spend, especially on the lower ends where they've got less discretionary spending. You put that together, smaller businesses are going to be struggling a bit more. Equity futures struggling just a little bit more here this morning. We're negative by 0.4%. Let's go through the price action for you. That's the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're negative by 0.45%. Yesterday, really struggled to put together a day of gains. The banks really faded, just to get you up to speed on PacWest this morning. Negative in the pre-market, back down to about 5 30. Bear in mind, last Monday, two Mondays ago, this opened up as a double-digit name, $10. Got hammered last week, tried to make a comeback Friday into Monday morning. That story's faded pretty quickly. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, going into CPI tomorrow, PPI the day after. Your two-year, still just short of 4%, down two or three basis points this morning, 397.22. On a 10-year maturity, we're down about two or three basis points to 348. In the FX market, off the back of some pretty weak data out of China, you get some euro weakness. Euro dollar, a break of 110 for the euro against the dollar, 109.80. We're negative 0.2%. Before we get to CPI and PPI, we've got to deal with this. President Biden and congressional leaders meeting at 4 p.m. this afternoon to try and break the partisan deadlock on the debt limit. Senate Mitch, Senator Mitch McConnell warning he won't come to Biden's rescue, saying this, they're assuming there's some secret little plan. The White House and the Speaker's teams need to sit down now and settle it. Joining us is Heidi Crevo Redeker, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Heidi, is there some secret little plan and do you have it with us this morning? <laughs> yeah, I come bearing the secret plan. Um, no, I think, uh, I think, you know, consistent with with what many of your your speakers uh, have been have been talking about, this meeting today is really you know the best the best outcome is that they continue to to, to talk and negotiate and, and open some um, you know a little bit of daylight uh, in the the ability to you know to carry on where this goes. Um, there is no secret plan, and I think the most important thing that markets need to understand is that. This is the, 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 we're in we're in uncharted territory right now because we you know when we've had these uh, these standoffs in the past um, we haven't had such a, a polarized Congress and polarized politics we haven't had um, such a narrow um, a narrow majority in the House and we haven't had a, a speaker who's made a, a deal that we don't we don't really know um, you know how much negotiating power he has but he did just pass um, he did just pass a um, a, a, you know, a, a bill, um, and it gives him leverage. So th there is no secret plan. I expect after this meeting today, 
everyone's going to take to the to to raw politics, going out to constituencies, whether it's business constituencies, whether it is um, going after fragile, you know, fragile um, red states where you have um, veterans, fentanyl, um, social security checks. Um, you're going to have a full blast on um, on media uh, about what's at what's at risk here. And I don't think that the Republicans are necessarily going to budge. Um, I don't think McCarthy has a lot of room to budge. So there is no secret plan. So when you said markets need to understand, there is a question about whether markets are being held hostage by this negotiation, that basically, as we heard from Dalip Singh yesterday of PGM Fixed Income, essentially, politicians are waiting for markets to freak out for the S&P to tank before they go to their constituents and say, we had no choice. Is that really what's going to basically uh, have to happen before there's a deal? So I think I, I would agree with Dalip that there there needs to be market pressure. There needs to be something, um, and we already have. I mean, it's unfortunate that that's what we're looking to to pressure um, politicians. But without that market that market signal, it makes it hard for McCarthy to go to the holdouts who are holding him hostage. Um, and say it is time to uh, to do a temporary lift of the of the debt ceiling to get us through um, and get us a little bit of space to negotiate so between uh, so so that nobody loses space at the end of this. This is incredibly difficult because if the politicians are waiting for markets to respond, markets are thinking we've been through this before and we're just going to lose our shirts. We're going to lose money and be on the wrong end of this if we play into this game of chicken, as John put it earlier, that Washington is playing with markets. So at what point is this just becoming circular before markets don't respond and then there is no deal? It actually makes it more likely that we get some sort of default. So the... The fact that we're we're talking in Washington about needing markets and markets are and and Wall Street's looking at Washington saying, "You guys got to do your job." Um, it 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 just it shows you what a gap there is between between uh, between D.C. and New York, and it's it means that we have um, you know it means that the system is obviously broken. It also means that we're we're putting out this picture on the world stage of the United States as as being hugely dysfunctional and not um, not a leader and, and steward of global markets um, and and the global economy. Uh, the the um, the pressure needs to come and whether it comes from outreach to constituents um, and uh, particularly in fragile states or from or from markets, there there needs to have we need to have the pressure that gets us to a, a relief period so you can align um, budget negotiations and debt ceiling negotiations so that everyone can walk away with some face saving at the end of this. Um, and we hope we get there. It's more likely to be in the fall than in uh, than over the summer. But in the meantime, you're going to have a lot of a lot of politics playing out. And that is um, that is bad for uh, well. It, it'll give you a lot to talk about. Um, <laughs> um, We'd rather this not is, talk this about is, this. Heidi. Story's not going to end just you know today after this meeting. Heidi, you alluded to something really important. Whether this compromises the United States on the international stage going into the G7, do you think that's the case? I think it. I think we have um, we we lose credibility. Um, we go in. We go in with a um, with a, a, a desire to project power. Um, to pro uh, project the the strength of the dollar as the as the central reserve currency of the world that we use underpins our our sanctions our economic statecraft we have uh, the deepest most liquid capital markets in the world we have uh, you know I don't think we actually even have a threat to the dollar that is out there right now except from our own doing um, our our own you know it's an own goal from from uh, from you know from from all. Uh, from, from every way you look at it, so Janet Yellen is coming. Uh, is uh, you know, her her G seven meeting um, is uh, is cut short? We have Biden heading out to a G seven and Quad meeting um, at the leaders level later this month. This will this will all be background music to a president that wants to go out and talk about leadership, stewardship, responsibility, and at home. We're going to have this political morass of, of debt ceiling negotiations. For a long, long time, the US had the luxury of doing questionable things. How do you think that luxury is no longer there? 
So I think that this, um, you know, our friends are watching us very closely. We're heading into a, uh, a, um, a presidential election cycle. So we're, you know, our friends are watching us closely, but we're literally playing into the hands of our, our foes. Those who would be, um, we're, we're, you know, we're handing our the talking points to um, to adversaries right now about the U.S.'s losing its ability to lead the global global economy to you know to lead the global um, global alliances, and it's just it, the, the timing is very bad. Uh, it's at a time when we are really trying to reassert that leadership, and we're not showing it at home. Heidi, appreciate your time. Let's catch up soon. Wonderful Thank input you. and insight, as always, from Heidi Kribo Redeker of the Council on Foreign Relations. For a long, long time, politicians in the US have had the luxury of doing silly things because markets ultimately forgive them because the Treasury market is such a different beast, Lisa, compared to the rest of the world, as we know. And you've raised this question. In the past, when we've had debt ceiling uh, questions, people have piled into Treasuries in this perversity that basically yields go lower. And it's the opposite of what you'd expect if actually uh, the credit uh, rating or the credit perspective seems to deteriorate. Does this time di uh, change? Is this time different with respect to people's willingness to buy Treasuries? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm kind of, I'm not sold on this. I don't know That's what That's the ultimate stress test for me. Speak to a fixed income strategist, investor. We'll catch up with Robert Tipper P. Jim, I think, in about 50 minutes' time. Ask him, if things get messy in the next month, will you buy treasuries? And if he says, yes, I will buy treasuries, then we've answered the question, haven't we? They have the luxury still of doing silly things down in D.C., well, yes, although people talk about the longer-term implications, which could potentially hamper the dollar's uh, supremacy and a whole host of other issues and whether, you know, the U.S. loses clout negotiating. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think that there's a bigger stress test. So, like we've done that conversation how many times over the last 10, 20 years? We could keep having it. Uh, true. No, I agree. We should keep having it. Just, you know. <laughs> What's that just hasn't stopped us before from Look, having a conversation repeatedly. at some point, repeatedly. it's different. Correct. At some point, it's different. And ultimately, every time we have this debate that's the question we ask is it different this time robert Tipper p jim coming up in the next hour looking forward to that equity futures negative here by 0.4 percent from new york this is bloomberg keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo treasury secretary janet yellen says that if congress fails to raise a debt ceiling it would have an adverse impact on the use of the dollar worldwide and would be an economic catastrophe for the nation. She told CNBC that the government would also need to figure out, quote, what to do with the resources that we do have. President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders today about the debt ceiling. The public's not showing much confidence in Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. According to a new Gallup poll, 36% of U.S. adults say they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence that Powell would do or recommend the right thing for the economy. That's the lowest level recorded since Gallup began tracking public confidence in the Fed chair in 2001. In Pakistan, former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been detained. The former cricket star faces a number of court cases and was set to be formally indicted on Wednesday. That has to do with the allegations that he did not properly disclose earnings from the sale of state gifts from his time in office. Khan has called for early elections next year after getting ousted in April 2022 in a no-confidence vote. Goldman Sachs will pay $215 million to settle a long-running class action lawsuit on underpaying women. The case involved about 2,800 female associates and vice presidents. It was closely watched in an industry where women have long said that complaining of unfair treatment can derail careers. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. There's a dangerous shortage of growth outside China, and even it is feeling, uh, feeling it from the rest of the world. Uh, that's uh, in large part because investment isn't going into the right places. You have basically a misallocation of capital where it goes into a narrower and narrower group of, of, of uh, governments in the advanced economies. 
That was David Malpass, the World Bank Group president, weighing in on the situation with global growth at the moment. That line there, the dangerous shortage of growth outside China. There might be a shortage of growth inside China. The latest data on the trade front not encouraging, particularly import growth. Absolutely plunging. The broader market this morning, negative 0.3% on the S&P 500. Yields on a 10-year look a little something like this on a 10-year at the moment, lower by a couple of basis points. 3.48 on a 10-year. Right now looking at crude, negative 0.9%. 72.52 on crude at the moment. Bank of America had a triple-digit crude forecast. That got cut in February to 88 just moments ago, cut again. They've cut their 23 forecast lease for Brent crude to $80 a barrel on what? A weaker outlook for global demand. What the issue for me is, we're not actually hearing that we're seeing that in the data, the underlying demand issues. I mean, take a look, for example, at all the people flying around the world. Take a look at all the people who are driving around. There isn't necessarily this massive decline in demand, and you're seeing that borne out in numbers. So is this an expected decline in economic activity that hasn't transpired? Or are people downgrading their expectations for crude because of the actuality of a lack of demand, particularly from China? I am not clear on this point. Let's get to the quote. Here it is. The first order effect of reduced credit and further interest rate hikes is weaker demand. Will Kennedy joins us now, Bloomberg's Senior Executive Editor for Energy and Commodities. Will, can we pick up on Lisa's question? And Will, great to see you, buddy, as always. Will, do you think this is about what we might see further down the road? Or are you seeing a softening of demand right here, right now? Lisa's point is a good one. We haven't seen any huge softening in demand as we look around the world. The, the point about planes is well made. Uh, uh, gasoline demand is uh, strong in many parts of the world and Chinese demand has picked up. I think there are a couple of things going on. I think there is concern about the economic uh, outlook in the year ahead and whether demand growth will be as strong as people expected. There has been some weakness in diesel demand, which is an indicator that the industrial economy may not be firing on all cylinders. And finally, I think people talk a lot about demand, but we should also look at supply. Yes, we've had that OPEC cut, but it hasn't been fully implemented yet. And there's still little sign that Russia is following through on its pledge to cut 500,000 barrels a day. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the American uh, shale industry still grows, albeit more slowly in the past. We get new oil from parts of South America like Guyana and Brazil. Um, and when you put those two things together, the supply and demand picture does not look quite as tight as it perhaps did a few months ago. Uh, that said, there are lots of analysts out there who say it will tighten in the second half of the year um, and th this market looks oversold, but we'll see. What do you think is driving that oversold? Is this basically a macro bet that people are using in macro hedge funds to uh, make some sort of statement on future declines in growth that people in the physical market don't understand? Is that kind of the, the narrative that you keep hearing? Um, that does seem to be what a lot of people are saying. I mean, clearly last year a lot of macro investors used oil as a way to uh, uh, bet on inflation. And I think now people are using the same trade uh, to bet on a, on a slowdown. Um, and that that creates uh, flows which aren't necessarily related to the real world uh, supply and demand of uh, crude oil, but more to people's expectations of the economy. And I think there's certainly uh, some of that going on when we look at the data. That said, um, a lot of those people, uh, you know, it does seem that the positioning has changed and that maybe there is room for some upside from here. Well, how fragile, and just to sort of build on that point, how fragile is market positioning right now based on the fact that a lack of credit actually means that production will be less going forward. This is a point that we've heard from J.P. Morgan in particular. Basically, think of the shale patch. They're not going to be producing more. A lot of oil majors are going to say, look at prices where they are. Why should we invest on producing more? And that will mean a tighter market later on. I think that's exactly right. When you look at the fundamental picture for crude oil in the year ahead, years ahead, uh, be it second half of this year or into next year, clearly you have a picture where demand is expected to increase. We don't know how uh, fast it will increase. It's always worth making the point that recessions tend to supply, uh, trim supply growth, but they very rarely, outside the global financial crisis or COVID, actually lead to a supply, a, a drop in um, total demand, just a weaker growth in demand. Um, and at the same time, supply is constrained for all the reasons that you mentioned. People aren't investing as much in oil uh, production as they used to. Um, so the fundamentals do on the surface look quite strong, but clearly uh, in the recent months something has uh, not quite right in that uh, transmission mechanism that many people are expected to see. I mean, it's worth pointing out, Lisa, that a lot of people have been caught, as you were saying at the top of the item with Bank of America, a lot of people have been uh, caught wrong-footed by this oil market this year. Will, are the Saudis happy with $76 Brent? 
I don't, well, the Saudis do not talk about prices. They do not target a price. It's always worth saying. So you won't get them to say they're unhappy. I think that the recent uh, demand, uh, sorry, the recent uh, production cut that we saw from OPEC uh, in April shows that they uh, are not happy at price levels and uh, at current price levels and clearly they got a bit of a boost and it's fallen all the way back to where it was. Um, we see today in the Aramco news that they're looking to take more dividends out of Aramco uh, and funnel it towards the state uh, and the Saudi uh, budget deficit has edged into deficit on these weaker prices. I think the common consensus for people who look at Saudi is that really to achieve the economic things that they want to do, they're more comfortable with getting prices closer to $100 a barrel, um, and they're clearly some way away from that. So while you won't hear them talk about a price, I think it's reasonable to infer uh, that they probably aren't happy with uh, oil in the 70s. They will. Great to get your perspective, as always. Will Kennedy out of London on the crude market. I think it's fair to say they're not happy with the 70s. Yes. So what next? Well, so do they just simply cut production even more, leading to an even tighter market? Or is this something where they basically want to allow this to play out, shake out all the potential competitors who are getting lower prices and then come in, you know? Didn't they try that before? Yeah, they did try that before. I, I don't know, but if they do cut uh, cut even more, that even speaks to the tightness in the market later on that people are talking about even more. Crude right now, 72. If you are just tuning in, the latest move from B of A, the team at Bank of America, led by Francisco Blanche, looking at this now, a 23 forecast, so year-end this year for Brent, of $80 a barrel on a weaker outlook for global demand. This is their quote, the first order effect of reduced credit and further interest rate hikes is weaker demand. So this is for year end. Year end was 100. It came down to 88. Then the targets come down to 80. So a pretty clear direction of travel there, Lisa, into year end for them. I'm distracted right now. And I'll tell you why. What, by? Because I'm hearing these things about the oil market. And then I read a story in the past couple of days about how airfares are rising at more than twice the rate of inflation. And you can't get tickets to a lot of the places that you want to go to. Double digit increases in the cost of airplane tickets for many consecutive months. And no pushback. And no pushback. No. And so you think about this kind of demand, you square that and all of the vacation time and how about consumer discretionaries and Airbnb, like all of these things that are like coming out. And then people are like, oh, but, but demand's going down and we're going to really struggle. I, I'm just tr struggling to square these things. Consumer price tolerance is just absolutely incredible on this front. There's been no pushback. It's amazing. I'm waiting for the pushback. I want the pushback because it's absolutely ridiculous. And yet, you know, if you want to fly, you still pay it. And particularly on international travel. JP Morgan came out with a note yesterday. I think it was them that upgraded the likes of the big players, American Airlines and those kind of people because of the international travel component to those companies. The smaller airlines, the domestic front facing ones, less enthusiastic about them. I think that's pretty interesting. International travel is nuts. TK sits there. You know when you and I are having a conversation what's and he, he looks doing? distracted? Yeah, He's looking he at flight prices. Know, actually, sometimes he does. All the time. Yeah. Just trying to gauge how much how much things are. They are increasingly expensive and there is no pushback as far as I can see. Maybe that's why I was distracted by flight prices while sure. I was sitting in this well, chair. Well, you're in TKC because I mean, it's got it preloaded. Right, exactly. So it's basically, you know, it is pretty distracting. But, you know, I wonder how much this is business, how much this is business travel and how much this is actually vacation. And I wonder how much you're going to end up seeing these cabins just become, you know, most of it being business class. It's happening. I know. And then everybody else kind of sardines in the back, forced to pay more, experience less. We're diversified. TK looks at United. You look at Delta and complain about it often. I try and look at American. See what's happening, just to balance things out. I'm all about balance. I'm all about we represent balance. a lot of things. Did you see uh, Biden yesterday talking about how he was going to make airlines pay for? Hotels? I didn't watch it. Do you want to share yeah. share with us all what did what did he have to say? I mean, just refunds for delayed or cancelled flights, hotels, etc. Totally on board with that. I Great. Mean, sure. more, more of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think it was just it was like obviously catering to everybody's frustration with the experience. I think there is an inverse correlation between how well airlines are doing and how we feel about airlines. I think that's always the case. <laughs> if airlines are doing well, that. you can just chart the stock price. I think you can get a decent feel for what the experience is like at the moment. Wasn't that Alitalia's problem? The experience was amazing. Alitalia's amazing. Right, but... You know, called Air Eater now. Yeah. You ever fly Alitalia, honestly? Wow. What a menu. <laughs> just amazing. That's exactly... How are they that's... doing profitability-wise? Well, I've got no idea, but they did go bankrupt, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> They've had some trouble. For good reason, because the food is so good. <laughs> Can I fly there? The, the margins on the food must be tiny. <laughs> then you go to these other airlines and you eat that stuff. Wow. <laughs>
we're in this very broken play, a world of a series of not just serious, but quite unique and rather unprecedented disruptions. I don't think we necessarily set a new low, but we could arguably retest those existing lows at some time before the end of the year. Right now, we have five cuts priced into Fed fund futures over the next 12 months. That's a lot. The market is underpricing the risk of the Fed remaining on hold for the remainder of the year. Unfortunately, I think a mild recession is the most likely outcome. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bramford, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, negative by 0.3%. No drama there. If you want some drama, look to the regionals. PacWest is down and down hard in the pre-market, trading at about $5 a share. Last Monday, a week ago, double-digit name breaking down again this morning and struggling to squeeze out a day of gains in yesterday's session off the back of the slews. Senior loan yeah. <laughs> officer opinion which survey, we like. which we apparently are obsessed with now, Bramog. Yeah, and actually Bloomberg Intelligence uh, came out and said that even though a lot of people said it didn't show that much tightening and the sleuths weren't exactly uh, incredibly uh, r revealing, they did show that even though companies weren't tightening as much as some expected, very few of them were expecting to increase their loans or loosen their, tight their, their conditions. So they think that actually this was a more bearish or tighter kind of credit report than many people are giving credit to. Little mini crises everywhere. I remember yeah. Mohamed al Erin talked about that about 18 months months ago he said all these little fires just coming up everywhere banking's one thing here's one that we've started ourselves the arsonists down in washington dc <laughs> the debt ceiling <laughs> drama later on i think we can call them that right sure we just did 4 p.m <laughs> eastern time mean, in the mean? oval office congressional leadership sitting down with the president of the united states democratic leader hakeem jeffries senate majority leader chuck schumer Mitch McConnell's going to be there. All fun and games. We're going to sort anything out later this afternoon. No, I mean, they basically said that we're not going to sort anything out. Don't expect anything. This isn't going to be a silver bullet. People are going to be looking for some sort of uh, wiggle room with negotiating on either side. How much, uh, Kevin Mc uh, how much Kevin McCarthy actually has a hold over the Republican Party. Same with the Democrats. My question just goes back to what we were talking about in the last hour is the game of chicken, as you called it. And I'm very concerned about this idea that Wall Street's seen this before. They're not going to move. Why should they lose money on something that's basically a game for Washington to be able to go back to constituents and saying, look, we had no choice? At the same time, without that, are they not going to get a deal done? And this is a really big problem, to my opinion. Playing chicken with the S&P 500. That's going to be the game that we're all playing over the next month or so. And right now, we're not seeing a big break on the S&P 500. The overwhelming consensus right now is this equity market wants its rate cuts and its growth too. And you can't have both. And part of this is because there has been this game of chicken with all of the economists calling for recession for so many months that hasn't happened and better than expected results. And all of a sudden, what do you end up having is a, is a is market that doesn't want to budge. It's just basically sick of the game of chicken to try to price something in. I think it's amazing to see Mike Wilson and Marco Kalanovic still on the same page. <laughs> still trying to get my head around that after <laughs> last year where Marco was so bullish and Mike was so bearish. And then seemingly this year, they're both bearish and they're saying essentially the same thing mike wilson morgan stanley started the week he said equity is a price for an optimistic and low probability outcome marco kalanovich said this over at jp morgan equity markets and the fed and the gap between them and the bond market likely to close at the expense of equities and that's the issue at the moment can you really price and this is what mike was talking about both rate cuts and durable growth can you have your rate cuts and your growth too no the only way that you could have that is if you have immaculate disinflation. And the data and what we will get tomorrow with CPI will probably highlight you cannot. At least that's not what we're seeing. We're getting sticky inflation in a number of different metrics. So then when does it get reconciled in markets that still want to go up? Let's talk about the market right now. Going down just a little bit. Negative 0.4% on the S&P 500 in the bond market, shaping up as follows. Yields a bit lower here, Lisa, no drama. Down a couple of basis points, your 10-year, a break of 350 at 348.24. It's been an exhausting market. Let's just all, I mean, honestly, I said that about 15 times yesterday. I said I wasn't going to say it today, and yet here I am saying it again. We get, of course, uh, at that meeting today. Earlier, we do get a host of Fed speak, including at 8.30 a.m. from Fed Governor Philip Jefferson, New York Fed President, uh, speaking later on, John Williams. How they talk about reconciling this gap will be interesting to me. That meeting does happen at 4 p.m., as John was mentioning, President Biden meeting with Republican leaders as well as Democratic leaders. How much do we get some 
signs that there are areas where they can come to some agreement, what the potential resolution could be, and really how much they really are looking to the S&P to force their hand, or whether there are some other uh, tools they're going to use. And today, earnings continue 85 percent the way through this earnings season. I'm particularly interested in some of the consumer discretionaries, Airbnb, uh, for example, Wynn Resorts, both of those shares surging so far this year, up more than 47 percent for Airbnb and 37 percent for Wynn Resorts. This increase in consumer discretionary spending is really one of the biggest question marks, in my opinion, given the fact that we see consumers still very much willing to spend, yet everyone's bearish on how the economy is going to do, the economy that hinges 70 percent on consumer discretionary spending or consumer spending in general. So trying to square this is really difficult and part of the frustrating aspect of this year. It's still a high nominal growth world. I can sense you're frustrated. Well, you it's didn't a... need to tell us. <laughs> you can just tell. This is what Savita Subramaniam said over at Bank of America. Q1 is tracking a 5 percent EPS beat. Surprise ratios of well above average. Guidance is strong. That's the takeaway from Beer Bag. Of course, on a very low base, but this is the truth, right? They're still doing okay. And you've seen a lack of confidence by corporate executives that isn't reflected by a lack of confidence in consumers who keep spending and now keep borrowing even more than companies. And joining us now is Katie Kaminsky, Chief Research Strategist at Alpha Simplex. Katie, wonderful to have you with us on the program. Can this market have its rate cuts and its growth too? No, not at the same time. I think part of the reason we have a challenge right now is the equity market is way ahead of itself. And I would say that we have to follow the bond market and follow inflation. And this is why everyone's sort of treading water to figure out how quick is inflation going to go down. If inflation continues to go up, we need to watch the bond market because long-term cash flows dislike inflation a lot. So uh, it's really going to be a question of does the bond market go first and then does the equity market follow? Um, and so I think we're much more concerned about bond markets than we are about the equity markets. We think we'll follow later. So, Katie, are you still short treasuries? Yes, the view is still short treasuries. I know a lot of people would say that March kind of definitely made that um, positioning challenge. But what we do see over medium to long term horizons, given the long term trend in fixed income, we've been in about a three year bear market for fixed income. We've consolidated for six months. Honestly, if inflation stays sticky, inflation is the bane of bonds existence. So we could see a steepener if people realize that long term cash flows will be affected by higher inflation for longer and a Fed that's on pause. Really, if we do actually have rate cuts, it would only be under a very bad scenario. So to me, that that looks like a not a, a very positive sign longer term for equities, while well, short term with mild inflation is OK bearish on bonds. Is this bearish on longer term bonds or bearish on short term bonds, especially given some of the fluctuations and distortions we're seeing on the short end? Well, I'd say it's been trickier on the short end. Um, I'm much more bearish on longer term bonds, because if you think about a scenario with higher inflation, holding long term cash flows is not an ideal scenario. Um, and so I'd say that really it's more medium term on the on the on the center of the curve that would be interesting. Uh, shorter term bonds are really uh, they've taken a lot of the moves if you think about how far they've come. So from our perspective, there's probably more movement available on the longer end of the curve. We've been talking all morning about the debt ceiling issues and sort of what happens for investors as we get closer to that deadline. The real test we were talking about earlier will be whether people continue to buy treasuries if there is some sort of stress or concern about a default uh, of the U.S. Would you think or would you become less bearish on bonds if the U.S. does approach that deadline? Well, think about it this way. I mean, I think the challenge with treasuries is all of this has created this massive unrelated risk. So you now have this massive risk that has nothing to do with the financial conditions that has everything to do with politics. And I think why people are waiting is, I think, Lisa, you put it perfectly, is that we, we, we need to see consolidation of the trend. We need to see where the market goes as a result of this, because it's really, really unclear for us to determine what the ramifications of challenges in with the debt ceiling really mean. Um, it's very complex um, at this point. So I think we're all waiting to see what happens. Just to drill down on that, though, Katie, to pick up on what Lisa's been talking about, do you believe this is still a buy Treasury moment or is it different this time? That's a good question. I mean, I think the challenge is why people were so 
bullish on treasuries was because they were concerned about the safety of their deposits. And it's really about following the money flow. And if people are nervous and they think that the U.S. Um, is not going to default or there's not going to be any sort of challenges in the treasury markets, I can see that those have generally been the risk risk, you know, the asset to choose in a safe haven environment. But if you look at some of these other assets like gold and platinum, they've really moved in this environment, which indicates that people are just not sure what a safe haven asset is uh, under these conditions. Well, Katie, I asked this specifically because you are short treasuries. And I wonder how painful that might be if we get to this situation where we carry on playing chicken with the S&P 500, things going in the wrong direction. And the playbook of the last decade Every time this happens, you buy treasuries. That's going to put an awful squeeze on you, Katie. I just wonder where you and the team have come down on that. Well, to be honest with you, the signals in treasuries are very mild. Um, and I think that's what you see across the board, that net-net, the view on treasuries is mildly short. Um, so it's not um, anywhere in the same ballpark of the type of signals that you saw last year. And I think what that indicates is this is sort of tentatively the direction is weakness in bonds, but because of all the volatility and all the noise, that's not an extremely so strong signal at this point. So I would actually consider that trends are in consolidation, waiting for the next big evidence that something is actually changing that could be a bear market for bonds. Or like you said, we could have a risk off and a recessionary shock that comes earlier than all of the economists are predicting, which is later this year. Um, I think we really need a catalyst is the debt ceiling a catalyst? I'm not sure. Katie, thank you. Katie Kaminsky there of Alpha Simplex. Short treasuries, but ultimately struggling to answer that question, Lisa. I think a lot of people are. Basically, this market, it's like we have no clue. We have no yep. edge. That's basically what everyone's been saying, because how can you predict and get in the heads of, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, like Chuck you Schumer? Can't. You can't. Thinking, I mean, honestly, try take, to try take to your try, yeah, take your pick. I think getting an edge on a story like this is impossibly difficult, which is why so many people refuse to discuss it in any level of detail. It's just a bunch of scenario analysis, like it's like a what if, and then and then what. And I was listening to Secretary Yellen yesterday, who didn't even want to engage no. in scenario analysis. So she literally said that. But what use is that? Well, and I mean, at this you point, know, central bankers drive me nuts. Can I just say that about? Please. It? So. They always say things like, let's not deal with hypotheticals. And I wish journalists would push back against that because they spend their whole life, their whole existence at these central banks trying to establish the reaction function. How do you convey the reaction function without discussing hypotheticals? That's a great question. And, and I wish people would just push back against that nonsense. Oh, you know, it's like the ultimate cop out, media yeah. training. You're asked the question you don't like about a right. scenario you don't want to talk about. I don't want to deal with hypotheticals. But they should say. It's but the better question it's is... It's literally your job <laughs> as a policymaker. It's a great the point. The prudent thing to do is to do a bunch of scenario analysis. Share it with the public. It's a great point. You know, that's a rant over. Lisa Shallot's coming up at Morgan Stanley. She'll take over the rant on this equity market a little bit later. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell warns he has no secret plan to solve the debt limit deadlock. Congressional leaders meet today with President Biden. McConnell says he told the president it was up to him and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to find a solution. At the same time, McConnell predicts the two sides will reach a deal and avoid a default. Vladimir Putin vowed to pursue his invasion of Ukraine, accusing the Kremlin's enemies of seeking to dismember Russia. Putin spoke at the start of the annual military parade celebrating the Soviet victory in World War II. He said that a real war has been unleashed against the motherland. Biotech company Novavax has plans to cut about 25 percent of its global workforce. The Maryland-based firm had a little under 2,000 employees at the end of last year. Novavax was one of the companies that geared up to make COVID vaccines after the coronavirus outbreak. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. It has to be done between the president and the House of Representatives and the Republican House of Representatives, the Republican majority. I think a short term debt ceiling increase would do a little bit of a cooling off period. The president needs to engage in the political reality of McCarthy's ability to lead that house. The president needs to show leadership. That's the line from Senator Bill Cassidy. 
of Louisiana. Here's the line from Senator Mitch McConnell. They're assuming there's some little secret plan here. I love this. <laughs> the White House and the Speaker's teams need to sit down now and settle it. There's no secret little plan here. Yeah, not exactly uh, encouraging. I'm waiting for the spin cycle for where everyone tries to pin the blame and the obstacles on the other party, because essentially, if this is political suicide, it's going to ultimately be a question of who they can pin this on. So I imagine that we will get a lot of, well, they're not willing to budge on this, and they're not willing to budge on this, and that's kind of what I'm expecting. Looking forward to that this evening. That's going to be great, <laughs> isn't it? I can't wait. Around about 6 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> Just wait. It's every single be exciting. news network in the United States of America. It's yeah. like the, the blame tour. Exactly. I love the blame tour after a nice meeting. It's <laughs> well, going to be great, I isn't mean, it? That's literally the playbook here, is to basically try to pin it on the other party for the other party to feel like it's politically suicidal for them to go uh, more than the other party. It's almost reliant on that blame game, holding the public hostage, holding markets hostage. God, I love this story. Holding Bramo hostage. <laughs> He's already, yeah, I mean, look, literally we're in the foothills of this mess. Like, it's just starting. <laughs> it's just starting. And you're already fed up with it. Later on today, 4 p.m. Eastern time, a meeting in the Oval Office between House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and the President of the United States and AMH trying to bang the door down. She joins us now in Washington. Anne-Marie, how important is this meeting later on this afternoon? It's really just an opening meeting and you can expect that given the rhetoric we've seen leading up to it, the red lines maintain for both the White House as well as Republicans in the Senate and in the House. So this is just going to be an opening meeting where I imagine the president is going to tell the Republicans they cannot hold the economy hostage. You heard what Secretary Yellen had to say over the weekend. She says what the Republicans are doing is basically a gun to the economy's head. And then what you're going to hear from Speaker McCarthy, and he's going to be backed up by Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who said there's no secret plan. He's going to say, in order to get this through my conference, I'm going to need to tie these two together, and I'm going to have to have fiscal cuts. And then what you guys are touching upon is really the important part. When they come out to the driveway, just behind the North Lawn, outside the Oval Office, this is going to be a battle for the airwaves. Which side is going to be winning in terms of public opinion? So who is to blame? I mean, what's basically the argument? What are the lines that are being drawn for how they're trying to, you know, frame the spin cycle that we're about to embark in? Well, Speaker McCarthy has made it clear he's done that so in two interviews with me that he's been wanting, almost begging the president for a meeting on this. Uh, the president has said, you know, show me a budget, show me a plan, and then we can talk. The president has says he has no problem discussing spending cuts and fiscal reform, but he does not want to tie it with the debt ceiling. You heard from Karine Jean-Pierre yesterday, the president's press secretary, saying that this is a manufactured crisis what the Republicans want to do. They continuously talk about how under the Trump administration, there was clean debt raises three times, and they want to see that happen again. They do not want to set a president. But the thing is, McCarthy cannot get that through his conference. And Jonathan, you brought up what he said about no secret plan, because many thought potentially Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden can hammer this out themselves. They did so in 2011. But then what McConnell said to Steve Dennis in this Bloomberg interview, I think, was one of the more important lines, which was, we're in a situation now in the House of Representatives that is much more reluctant to enter into a deal than we had in 2011. And that is at the heart of the problem for Speaker McCarthy. He is not able to get a clean deal through his caucus. The legal consequences of this are particularly interesting, not least because of the discussion around the 14th Amendment. But uh, U.S. government employees are considering suing the federal government to continue to pay them, to continue to, uh, to increase and, and, and make good on their obligations because they believe that they are contractually obligated and they're trying to get ahead of a situation like they have been in the past where they didn't get paid for a couple of weeks. Could there be some sort of legal challenge to spending cuts that were already agreed upon by the government? I'm sure there could be. And if there's a 14th Amendment use, even Secretary Yellen said that would cause a constitutional crisis. You can imagine that that would also um, invoke some legal issues on the other side, saying that this is illegal to do in the hands of this or in Congress. Um, so this can get very messy. I think one thing is important to note 
that we have seen this movie before. Yes, it is different, and McConnell really alluded to that yesterday, but many maintain that none of these individuals, the big four or President Biden, want to see a default. So at some point, people stu- still believe there will be a deal, and deals don't get done in Washington until the 11th hour. The most interesting person in the room is always the quietest person in the room. And I just had a message about Mitch McConnell that I find pretty interesting, to be honest with you, Anne-Marie. Senator McConnell, yes, yeah, spoke a little bit, but to be honest with you, hasn't really stuck his neck out, has he, Anne-Marie, in any way, shape or form? Why do you think that might be? Well, from the beginning, he said this is a negotiation between McCarthy and Biden. He did the last one, but the numbers are different. The House has control under the Republican leadership. Uh, He says that he cannot get anything through the Senate, that the House Republicans are not able to sign off. So what he's doing is really sitting back and I think seeing as far as negotiations can go between Speaker McCarthy and Joe Biden. And what you really saw over the weekend is Republicans on the Senate side coalescing around Kevin McCarthy. Forty-three of them wrote this letter saying they will not vote for a clean debt hike. And then, of course, we had Mitch McConnell sitting down with our Steve Dennis saying there's no secret plan here in the Senate. It has to be worked out between the House leadership and the White House. I'm always interested in how a reporter correspondent gauges the consensus as it evolves. Do you get the feeling in Washington at the moment, Anne-Marie, that that consensus is shifting towards some kind of short-term solution that kicks the can into later this year? Well, as Mike McKee always quotes, in Washington, when you run out of land, build more land. Um, So this is a potential. We have seen this before. I think one big issue with this is potentially there are going to be these House Republicans who, if there's a short-term agreement, and then obviously they need to have a longer-term agreement, that would be, at the end of the year, three votes on raising the debt ceiling. And for some, that is politically toxic. AMH. Great to catch up. And Marie, down in Washington, D.C., it won't get solved until the 11th hour. The problem with all of this, of course, is we don't know what the 11th hour is. We think we've got some idea of where it lands. That X state could be as early as June, could be as late as the end of June. And as a policymaker, you've got to be conservative about these things, right? You've got to come in earlier just to make sure that, you know, you don't hit the date on accident. Basically, the fact that Janet Yellen said June 1st means that it's probably closer to June 30th is basically what you're saying. Precisely. <laughs> which is, I think, what markets are kind of counting on, which is the reason why you haven't seen the concern. You asked a great question about Mitch McConnell and how he's been so quiet. And I think about the political liability at a time when the Republican Party is coalescing around former President Trump as the likely candidate to run against President Biden in the next election. And sort of this... this discomfort and unwillingness to really tread into the morass of, uh, of, of, of the different sides and the polarization within parties that you see on both sides. If they don't have to tread into that, why are they going to? Why get caught in a mud singing fight? Exactly. You know, everyone's going to look stupid. Seems to be the takeaway from the messages I'm receiving this morning. Which makes perfect sense at a time when you just want to stay clear because there's no winning here. Everyone's going to look pretty bad after this. How many more months have we got of this? What's this? Are you talking about the election cycle? You're talking no, about debt ceiling. I'm talking debate. about this specifically. This might go another what, six to eight weeks, possibly. I'm I'm just I'm still really struggling with this idea that they're waiting for Wall Street to respond, that they're waiting for the S and P to fall before they can take action. Not new. Do you not remember when President Obama said, you know, basically encouraged the market to respond? I remember that to the mess. I remember that. I also remember, you know, the idea that the Fed was using the market to kind of send a message to also uh, be the transmission mechanism. Is the market now the transmission mechanism for political wrangling in Washington, D.C.? At what point do people get sick of being used as that mechanism and then that mechanism kind of dampens as a tool? It's highly irresponsible to play games with financial markets. Highly, highly irresponsible. But if that's the game, I guess that's the game and we need to pay attention to it. Robert Tipper, P. Jim's going to join us shortly. He'll weigh in on this situation in the equity market at the moment on the S&P 500. Near session lows, negative 0.4%. That meeting with congressional leadership and the president taking place in the Oval Office at 4pm Eastern time. After that, the focus is going to shift to CPI in America tomorrow morning. Then on to PPI the day after that. Future softer, lower, negative. Yields down two by a couple of basis points. We're down to about 348.24 on a 10 year. And in the FX market, a break of 110 on a euro against the dollar. Euro dollar 109.75, negative 0.26%.
from New York City. Welcome to the program this morning. Good morning to you on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, and here's the price action on the S&P 500. If you are just tuning in, welcome. We are negative by 0.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, struggling just a little bit too. We're down by 0.5% on the Nasdaq 100. Futures a bit softer in the bond market. Yields a little bit lower through the curve. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, down somewhere like two to three basis points across the curve on a two year down about three to 397 on a 10 year down two basis points to 348. The next stop for this market, of course, the negotiations around the debt ceiling. We all can't wait for that. Then on to tomorrow morning, US CPI, 830 Eastern time. Then on to PPI the day after that. Bramo, it's exciting stuff, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm actually really is. I'm more excited about CPI and PPI, certainly, than the debt ceiling debate, uh, which I, I think it's not really hidden how I feel about that discussion. To give you a sense of what's going on in some of the specific names as we do get the rolling earnings come in, I want to talk about three different stories. The first, margin compression. The second, artificial intelligence boosting all. The third, job cuts being rewarded in the market. PayPal, margin compression. That is really what you see. They warned that uh, the margins aren't going to grow as quickly as people expected. Those shares down 5.5%. You're seeing a similar kind of trend within the financial services uh, industry more broadly. Palantir just had to say artificial intelligence demand was out of sight, off the charts, incredible. Those shares up 15.4%, uh, given the fact that that is the hot moment, chat GBT, and your shares go up, sort of like blockchain in another era. And then what you see over at Novavax, uh, the vaccine maker saying that it was going to cut around a quarter of its workforce, also having some pretty negative prognostications, and those shares up 7%. So how much is this basically rewarding job cuts as being the way to cut to some sort of profitability or increased profitability? It's sort of three snapshots of themes that we see throughout the earnings season as people try to adapt and adjust in this new era. You're sitting in that chair, aren't you? I'm really sitting here. Is that why you're here. using that phrase? Oh, yeah. I'm gonna, adapt and adjust. I'm going to look at airline tickets and I'm going to adapt and adjust and, you know, we're going to... You're going gonna to be data through. dependent? <laughs> Always. We miss TK. TK is going to be back with tomorrow and until then, um, Bramo's going to do impressions of TK. Sluice. Subtle ones. Yeah. Sluice. That was a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Too. I appreciate it. Tomorrow, US CPI. Key data point, of course, for the Federal Reserve. Robert Tipper, P. Jim Wang in on that. The markets have already priced in a fairly aggressive easing cycle. He goes on to say, suggesting some upside risks for long rates. Credit spreads are likely to remain range-bound thanks to strong investor demand, allowing the spread sectors to continue registering positive excess returns. Pleased to say that joining us now is Robert Tip, Chief Investment Strategist, Head of Global Bonds at PGIM Fixed Income. Robert, we talked about the 11th hour. Someone corrected us very quickly and said it won't be the 11th hour. It will be the 11th hour, the 59th minute and the 59th <laughs> second. And Robert Tip, maybe that's the case. When we get to the 11th hour, the 59th minute and the 59th second, if it gets messy, Robert, are we buying or selling treasuries? Right. Well, in the short term, I think you're buying treasuries, right? It, it'd be a risk-off event, and um, there may be variations in how the curve uh, deals with it. It could be bad for the back end of the curve. The long end could underperform. Uh, but in a flight to quality, treasuries usually do well. Uh, we saw that in the SVB crisis, and we've seen it in past debt crises uh, in the U.S. before. Uh, and I think that would be the case this time as well. I think it's worth keeping in mind, though, that 12 to 24 months down the road, unless we happen to be right at another debt ceiling debate, you know, I don't think this is going to matter. Uh, I think it is uh, extremely important in the short term how it gets resolved, and it may be uh, of epic proportions uh, if you get certain kinds of outcomes, um, some that are, are, are widely uh, envisioned and some maybe less so. Um, but 12 to 24 months from now, I think the basics, the risk here, alluding to your curve, which is expecting rate cuts, is that we may have evolved into a different kind of secular environment where the growth is not so much so debt driven. Uh, and that as a result, you know, growth continues here uh, and we end up seeing the Fed holding or, or doing more hikes uh, and, and getting some upward adjustment in the belly of the yield curve. Interesting. So, Robert, two time horizons there and two things to unpack. Let's deal with them separately. Let's deal with the first one, the short term. Do you and the team think this gets solved anytime soon, the debt ceiling gets addressed? And what informs that view? What do you look to, Robert, to get that idea? Sure. Well, I think the easy part uh, is that nobody, it's in nobody's interest to cave early. Everybody wants to show that they negotiated up until the very last minute. 
and the system in a way is in place. Uh, you know, the United States, this, this freak of nature with this messy system that's been, you know, ultimately very successful is designed to prevent any one idea, any one party, any one group from getting too much power. Uh, so it's very hard to, uh, to, to move anything forward or stop anything. This is going to go right down to the last minute. I think what will be interesting in a way, though, is if uh, Joe Biden uh, goes for, for a power play of, of sorts, ends up being kind of a, a, a sleeper in the sense of continues to say, you know, this is the best budget that you could pass. Uh, and all of the spending, all the taxes, these are the best policies that you could come up with. You need to have the borrowing capacity. And if they do not give him a, a clean increase in the debt ceiling, that invokes the 14th Amendment, goes ahead and makes the payment. And uh, the worst case scenario would be that then, you know, the government is sued uh, effectively. I'm not a legal expert. And either it's upheld or it's shot down. If it's shot down, well, then every time you come up against the debt ceiling, you have to get it raised. Uh, but on the other hand, if it's upheld and prioritization of principal and interest payments is allowed, uh, then this thing is gone forever. In a way, that's a loss in that it, it allows profligate uh, increases in, in debt to GDP to continue ad nauseum. Um, but in terms of uh, traders and anxiety, it would be a big win. Well, this is something that Jenny Allen has called a constitutional crisis, should it be invoked. So it's not necessarily what they want to uh, have happen at a time when they do not want the legal challenges and they want some sort of consensus. Let's put that aside for one minute, uh, Robert, and get your sense of how this is going to work if the market just sits on its hands. Are you concerned that a lack of reaction as everyone waits for the 11th hour, 59th minute and 59th second to make any kind of moves will mean that this actually will not get done in time? Uh, I think that uh, you are going to see an increase in anxiety as the balances run low. And, uh, you know, if there's a, an accidental default, you will see a drop in stock prices, a drop in yields, and a widening of credit spreads. Um, but I think that uh, the economy is pretty resilient to those kinds of shocks. I mean, whether you're looking at October 1987 and the stock market decline then, uh, whether you're looking at the volatility surge in 2018, uh, the economy is not derailed by those incidents of, of volatility. And most like the, the current cycle is the, the increase in interest rates, say, in 1994. Quick Fed rate hike cycle, a lot of volatility in the markets. Uh, economy powers through that. So, uh, again, I think 12 to 24 months from now, this is not going to be a major economic event. It could, though, in the short term, be very jarring for the markets. Well, how do you play that? I mean, is it frustrating for you? Do you feel like you're being used as a pawn, as a market participant in Washington's games, or is this a good trading opportunity where perhaps you can get ahead and have an edge? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of each. I think that in, in the CDS markets, um, you know, the in terms of the term structure there, I mean, people are, are paying real money to protect against a default in the short term. And, uh, you know, there could be a, a, a trade to do there. Um, but I think as a as an investor, uh, everybody has their edge. And I would think, uh, you know, for some, for investors, their edge may be in, in assessing what's the 12 to 24 month environment, how are fundamentals dramatically uh, differently priced from where they should be. And I think right now is one of those environments where uh, the market is heavily biased towards pricing in a recession. Uh, and um, and having a more optimistic view is 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 going to be the uh, the best approach. Uh, tactical trades on on the debt ceiling, I think you can do on the margin, but should not be a major aspect. Did you buy some Apple debt yesterday, Robert? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on. Uh, I didn't you know, expect it to. Trades, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you I can think, build on um, it a little bit, Robert, if you can. I think yeah, I think the market here, uh, you know, is supportive. Uh, here it sees yields as having traversed the range of the last 10, 20 years, and yields are attractive. And I think some of the inversion of the curve, the demand for corporate bonds, the fact that spreads are supported in the face of what people think is going to be a recession, uh, is indicative of the fact that people need yield, uh, and uh, and that the market is well supported, and and that uh, you're likely to see spreads. The range that we've seen over the last year is is going to hold. Robert Tip, a PGM diplomatic at the end there. Thank you, sir.
rubber tip on a credit market, constructive. Looking at Apple yesterday, so as I understand it, just the, the way this story evolved through the day, Bramo, based on our reporting, is that the order bit was huge, tons and tons of demand, and then they tightened things up and demand kind of faded a little bit. That basically there was a real time pricing where Apple was like, let's push this and see how far we yeah. can go because you guys wanted this so badly. Here you go. And the people said, wait a second, when we're looking for income, we're actually looking for income. And at a certain point, we're just going to draw the line. So what you are seeing is that, yes, there is a ton of demand, but they are exacting a price that investors would like the income. And if it's not there, they're not going to buy. And that's an interesting distinction. It's not a free for all. It's not a food fight. It's not the market that it was a couple of years ago. Exactly. It's not 2013, 2014. This is a different environment where people are prioritizing income. Or even the post pandemic years when the Fed just sort of buried rates and <laughs> was buying bonds every month. It's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's basically the same story. Basically, when the Fed is supporting the market and when they're putting that bid in and they're putting their thumb on the scale, people don't care as much about income because there is none elsewhere. Now, all of a sudden, that equation has changed. And I wonder whether Apple selling this bond deal, it's not actually that much. Five and a quarter billion dollars is nothing for them. So is this basically a test to understand what the level is for, their, for them to tap and to sort of have access to this market, but not a real finance? It's kind of like the AVMH deal from a number of weeks ago. Yeah. When you get these really great companies with fat margins, great profits, and they don't issue that much debt, and they come to the market, you know, like, when was the last time Apple came? August yeah. last year, similar amount. What can you learn from it? You can learn what the almost risk-free rate is, basically what the corporate rate is for the highest rated and most uh, highly sought after paper is. Basically, what's the line in the sand in terms of income on corporate debt? We're finding that out slowly. Finding out as well from the sleuths, just wanted to fit in the sleuths. I know, I know. The senior loan officer opinion survey that came out yesterday that things are tightening up and, and demand is weakening too. But as many people have pointed out this morning, it feels like that's a feature of monetary policy and, and not a bug. Wait is for it, the next one. Okay, so is it really a problem if it's just gradual? Is it make a big difference if it's all at once or if it's gradual? And some people are saying yes, and other people are saying just wait for it. It'll, you know, it's all, all at once. Suddenly, quietly, and then all at once. City still sees hikes in in June and July. I mean, the CPI tomorrow, it's expected to be hot. 8.30 Eastern Time tomorrow morning. Neil Dutta joins us at 8.30 Eastern Time this morning. We'll catch up with him in about 50 minutes' time. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says that if Congress fails to raise a debt ceiling, it would have an adverse impact on the use of the dollar worldwide and would be an economic catastrophe for the nation. She told CNBC that the government would also need to figure out, quote, what to do with the resources that we do have. President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders today about the debt ceiling. The public's not showing much confidence in Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. According to a new Gallup poll, only 36 percent of U.S. adults say they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence that Powell would do or recommend the right thing for the economy. That's the lowest level recorded since Gallup began tracking public confidence in the Fed chair in 2001. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell predicts that Congress will keep funding Ukraine's defense. That's despite growing calls from some members of his own party to reduce or end the aid. McConnell has called on President Biden to speed up shipments of high-tech weapons to Ukraine. Ryanair is betting big on the travel recovery that's picked up pace in recent months. Bloomberg's learned that Europe's largest discount airline is close to placing an order with Boeing for about 150 737 10, MAX 10 jets. Now Ryanair is Boeing's biggest customer in Europe. And Under Armour keeps struggling in its turnaround effort. The athletic gear maker fell after its full year earnings missed estimates. Under Armour warned in February that a buildup in inventory would lead to more promotions across the category and recovery would take longer than expected. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think that the market is underpricing the risk of the Fed remaining on hold for the remainder of the year. We're pricing in cuts uh, for the second half of the year. Uh, if, uh, you know, if we can get past the regional banking crisis, I don't see any reason for the Fed to, to jump into cut, cutting rates uh, in the second half. Sabadra Japa there, the head of U.S. rate strategy at SOCGen on the great rate debate. 
right now. The question that Lisa and I have asked all this morning, can this market have its rate cuts and its growth too? And there seems to be some pushback against that, Lisa. I think you gave the one exception and you're right to point it out. The one thing that can get this done is the so-called immaculate disinflation. If we can get that, there's a reason for the Fed to back away. And obviously that happens without growth getting hammered. The likelihood of that is pretty much nil, which is what a lot of people keep pointing to the data, which we get tomorrow and then on Thursday, which should show a stickiness to the inflation. But to me, this is the main question, and this tension is not getting resolved month after month, which is, are we going to see massive rate cuts in the face of some massive crisis, or are we going to see rates that are much higher with no rate cuts for a substantial period of time, which is going to torpedo certain equity valuations, and these polls are not getting resolved. If it's because, quote, a massive crisis... That doesn't sound like a reason to buy stocks, does it? But that's exactly right. So that's the reason why you're seeing equities rally. It's sort of a confusing conundrum that people have. Everyone's talking it down. And then more people say, look, you guys have been bearish forever. So what makes you think you're going to be right now? PacWest not rallying this morning. That's one to watch in the pre-market. A move of about 60 cents now works out to about 10% of the overall name. That's trading at about $5 in the pre-market. Lisa, we're down almost 10% in early trading. And if you look at the KBW index, it just hasn't recovered. I just keep going back to that, even though people are saying it's over. It's, you know, everything is stable. You're seeing deposits stabilized. Now it's a, a profitability question. At what point do we say it actually is over? And can we move on to really discussing the fundamentals? KRX, the regional bank index, has just been there bouncing along the bottom for two months now. Exactly. Two months, can't get a rally. Is this a profitability question? Is this basically people waiting for the next shoe to drop with another one, especially with commercial real estate? I know I am sitting in this chair, so I'm going to bring up commercial real estate too. Sure. Which is uh, something that people are very concerned about. I haven't noticed that. I have noticed that. He likes to talk about that a lot. He tracks the buildings in different cities and then sees anecdotal declines in specific ones and then says, you know, the sky's falling. But it it, it is in certain sectors, but in others it's not, which is the reason why it's a bit difficult to get your hands around. TK's dashboard, like squirrels running around. Commercial real estate. What else is on there? Airline tickets. Airline tickets. First okay. class to Europe, to around yeah, the world. Or wherever. Asia, somewhere. Or Asia. Um, there also is, of course, the tots and scores and, and, and like the, the clips. Buzzwords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adjust and adapt and stuff like and that. And then, of course, bow tie, you know, scrolling. He bids. scrolls through bow ties. Is that what you're suggesting? TK. I, I TK. <laughs> Bramo. He scrolls through bow ties. Nice. I don't know. I'll, I'll do some more investigating. Speaking of buzzwords, if you want to get a bid in your stock right now, <laughs> you hold an earnings call and you just talk about AI. And the problem that I've got with that at the moment is that I've got no idea if it's just a tech bro BSing me or whether there's actually something fundamental to the company here and there's a reason to buy the name. I think you're not alone. I mean, how about Microsoft? They come out artificial intelligence is going to make us bing all the way home and we're going to take over over my head and we're going to take over and we're going to eat google's lunch and then other people say well actually google's in a great position and they just didn't do a good enough pr job and that's the reason why their shares didn't pop a lot i don't think anyone really has a sense of what's going to give someone the upper hand because a lot of the technology the neural nets underpinning this have a lot of question marks around them that even the professionals cannot really answer zombie roll up my bloomberg's lighting up now (laughs) people are coming up with TK phrases. Mandeep Singh joins us now, Senior Technology Analyst for Bloomberg (laughs) Intelligence. Mandeep, can you help me understand what's happening with AI and help guide us all? When there are these earnings calls and these executives talk about the benefits of AI and how well positioned they are, how well positioned are some of these companies, Mandeep? Well, so I would look at it in uh, two different ways. One is you have to look at the companies that are enabling the infrastructure, you know, the chip companies, and we can talk about valuation, but there is something underlying that is enabling this AI wave, really cloud capacity, you know, the processing capacity you have and the latest chips we have. And some of it has to do with the other aspect of it is the data side of it. You know, how do you train these models? I think a lot of companies are realizing, you know, uh, they didn't have the IP on the data sets that they are training these models on. So clearly there is value in terms of leveraging, you know, AI in terms of what we have done over the last five years with machine learning. And this is the logical next step. But uh, in terms of the applications that will be really disruptive, we don't know that yet. And I think every CEO right now wants to leverage this, but 
they obviously are trying to figure out, you know, what is the best possible way to monetize this technology. Palantir Technologies came out and said that demand for its new artificial intelligence tool due this month is, quote, without precedent. In response, the shares surged 21 percent, even though we don't have exactly a concrete sense of what yeah. that exactly was going to mean. Now the share's up about 17% pre-market trading. How do you gauge, Mandeep, uh, whether something is real or simply just a new fad on Wall Street? Well, so I do want to use my infrastructure versus application lens. I think infrastructure revenue will be more uh, tangible in the near term simply because that's what will help you build these applications. In terms of what will get disruptive, whether it's search or anything on the software side, only time will tell because uh, the efficacy of you know using that software or using those search results is yet to be determined. Although I think the initial response is yes, this is something better than what we used to have, and if we are able to you know weed out the noise, then uh, people can see it driving productivity. So I won't call everything is a bubble, but. You know, in the case of uh, like Palantir, for example, they are a very specialized software. It's great for, you know, uh, doing uh, fraud detection or uh, maybe detecting cyber attacks, but it's not a solution that you can roll out to uh, thousands or, you know, uh, millions of uh, customers because it's it, it can be customized so quickly. So the fact that they are talking about AI is too soon to me. Yes, they are investing in it, but I don't think they're at a point where they will be able to monetize it anytime soon. Mandy, just to get your sense on the whole machines versus humans kind of debate, because a lot of people are wondering what limits there should be on this. And we've heard from a number of tech executives that they are concerned about unfettered use of technology and, and theory, frankly, that people don't understand if they try to extrapolate it out, what it will mean. What do you think the likely outgrowth of that will be? How many sort of self-imposed restrictions on the development of some of the sort of more nuanced artificial intelligence, the sort of more human-like aspects and, and how they will be implemented? I mean, the best way to frame it is look at, you know, how the internet content is consumed. And there are safety uh, issues around it and you put guardrails in terms of who can access, uh, you know, that type of content that may be nefarious or, you know, is not something you want your kids to be exposed to. And over time, these things develop. I think regulators will probably be late in terms of, you know, putting those guard, guardrails. But I do think, you know, from a productivity standpoint, you can see how, you know, if you can enhance somebody's learning. And, and that's where, you know, the bad aspects got highlighted first, that it could write a kid's essay uh, for college. But what about if it enhances learning? And that's what I think Khan Academy has talked about. And, and there you could see value in something like AI, you know, being that personal assistant for a student. And, and so I do think, you know, use cases will evolve. And yes, you have to focus on safety and the regulators will come in eventually. But uh, like with any new technology, you will see the disruptive aspects first and then you put the guardrails. Students need personal assistance. Bramo. I knew you were going to pick what up you were on that. Of course, of, exactly. It? I was thinking, well, can I have one? But yeah, they're going to get personal assistance to do what? I mean, that's really the question. Are they going to get personal assistance to write their essays or are they going to get personal assistance to sort of get the information that they need to write said essays and it will be more of a critical thinking exercise? Does this widen the divide between people who are, I don't know, it raises a lot of questions. Mandeep, thank you. Mandeep Singh there. When Mandeep talked about it writing an essay, said we highlighted some of the bad things. What's bad about that? All this is going to highlight is how pointless some of these things are that we get taught at school. That's all it highlights. OK, hold up. I have to help with some of these situations and these, you know, this well, is this how, is how a do you risen. intend to help? Go well, on. Okay, I mean, just at a personal level, as, okay. as a parent um, of 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 a s offspring that have to write essays that have alleged that others are using ChatGPT to write their essays, there is a concern and there is an importance just in the development and critical thinking and organizing thoughts of being able to research information and to be able to concisely put it together in some sort of coherent document. That is what ChatGPT does for people. So they lose the exercise of doing that, which I do think is useful. That said, could you then open up to questions that are more qualitative, that are more difficult and more nuanced to write? And how quickly can they do that before ChatGPT catches up? It, it raises a lot of questions. I mean, with a personal assistant, what are they assisting in? We're on the same page on the critical thinking skills, without a doubt. Yeah, that's important. I want that. I agree. But there are so many other things that you get taught at school. 
which are just utterly pointless. I mean, I'm happy to outsource that. If I was a kid, I'd just be like, you know, that's productive. A calculator. Good on him. Good on him. <laughs>The tightening of credit conditions in the wake of the bank failures is going to be a very big deal. The bank ecosystem that the United States has is internationally unusual. America has a lot of banks. There's going to be this enduring tension where pretty decent news means earnings don't collapse. It's going to be very hard for a meaningful decline in yields from here on as well. So it's going to be one of those situations where yields remain range bound. The market has shifted its focus away from inflation and back to growth. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. If you're serious about occupying that chair, you've got to bang the keyboard and clear your throat. <laughs> All right, repeat <clears> that. <throat> but the worst possible time. <laughs> at, the wor at the worst possible time. I'm trying. I don't know. I don't at think I can keep this up. Time. Never hear him clear his throat when we're off air. That's you know, <laughs> just super smooth. <laughs> From New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just needs to be heard. This is Bloomberg Surveillance <laughs> on TV and radio. I <laughs> can't do it. You just record it and press play. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative 0.4%. With Lisa Brown, with some Jonathan Farrow. TK back with us tomorrow with a full array of sound effects. Going into CPI <laughs> tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern time. Then on to PPI the day after that. A little bit later on this afternoon, we're all focused on this meeting between the president and congressional leadership in the Oval Office, 4 p.m. Eastern time. The debt ceiling showdown. But ultimately, you speak to people who are well connected to this story. Lisa, and they will tell you the same thing. They don't think anything happens today. There's no way that anything happens today because they need to wait for the uh, the whole debate to drag on long enough to be able to have political cover to say we did our best. And so this is a reason why the market isn't responding. And yet we've been talking about it all morning. Politicians are waiting for the market to respond. So this is going to be fun. A rose tinted glasses in the market. You get the best of all worlds. Durable growth, rate cuts, robust earnings in a high nominal growth world. It's pretty decent stuff, isn't okay. it? In fairness to the equity bulls, they've been largely right, especially if they've gotten on tech. And so at a certain point, they could say, all right, you doomsdayers, you can keep going with all of your discussions about what's going to happen, but it hasn't been working, so neener, neener. And I mean, at a certain point, there is this frustration that's percolating out where it just isn't necessarily, the logic isn't playing out in markets the way it traditionally does. And Nina, Nina. <laughs> okay. Lisa Shallett joins us now, Chief Investment Officer at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. I've got no idea what that was, Bramo. Lisa, thanks for being with us. I won't ask you to translate, Lisa. I will ask you this, though. Just how frustrating is this market, Lisa, when you look at things like all the rate cuts that are being priced, yet at the same time there is this feeling that we will continue to live with durable growth? Yeah, so look, I, I think uh, there are a lot of conundrums in this current market. And I think that probably the single most frustrating thing uh, is the benchmark at this point. You know, most uh, institutional investors, most retail investors define the market as the S&P 500 index. Uh, that index, as we know, is, is up almost 8% uh, year to date, up 17%. Uh, from last October's low, uh, but certainly for the last you know four or five months, a huge portion of that move, at least you know since January 31st, uh, has essentially come from seven stocks, the mega cap uh, tech stocks, who led uh, for most of the the prior 13 years. The you know what we you know uh, I think affectionately nicknamed the Fangs or Fangs M plus whatever. Um, and uh, I think it what has been frustrating is that underneath the surface, a lot of the uh, indicators that are flashing recession have crushed the cyclicals. We've seen uh, the devastation of the regional banking system as the Fed has raised rates and as the implications of tightening have begun to show. And yet there's that benchmark, uh, you know, supported by that heavy concentration at the top, uh, you know, chugging along when below the surface, uh, there seems to be, you know, some pain and suffering and damage. Um, small caps in particular uh, have been crushed. So Lisa, the question we've got to ask then is, can this persist? And if it can't, what would bring down some of the big tech heavyweights that have supported this market? 
Yes, I, th I think the reality is that in the short term, it can persist. Uh, you know, certainly as long as we're, you know, kind of in this stalemate, uh, I think to your point between, you know, some labor market resilience, the power of pricing power and, and some of the nominal growth drivers uh, that can support some of those names. Now, ultimately, you know, our thesis has been that, you know, there are no uh, companies that ultimately are immune from uh, recession or or significant economic slowing, and and we don't think that this time uh, ultimately will be different, um, even though it has felt uh, that way at moments. So our best guess continues to be. Uh, that there are some earnings disappointments out there. I mean, one of the things that folks have to uh, digest is that the way earnings are modeled, uh, it looks like we're on a hockey stick towards recovery over the next couple of quarters with, you know, this uh, first quarter that's being completed representing a trough in earnings growth. Uh, and then we kind of, uh, you know, kind of get, year-over-year year earnings that are better and better every quarter until we get to 2024, where the market's looking for up 13% earnings. Now, you know, we're, we're still very close to, to peak economic growth and peak uh, corporate profit margins. So that's going to be a feat uh, to achieve those expectations. Lisa, what would it take for you to throw in the towel and basically just say this time is different? I think the fundamental I issue for us is if we see a reacceleration in economic growth. If the consumer really does prove uh, to be resilient, if the uh, slowing that we expect to emanate really from the credit crunch does not materialize, if there's enough savings cushion, and we would probably see that in the next two quarters uh, where there, these earnings that look like a hockey stick recovery uh, are achieved. If those earnings are achieved, then uh, quite frankly, our thesis is wrong. There's another uh, aspect to this that some people keep bringing up, which is perhaps the largest companies are consolidating market share to such a degree and taking it away from smaller companies. So you could see small caps basically blown up, absolutely uh, you know, decline dramatically, which is something that we have seen in certain pockets, even as the large caps continue to chug along and chart really impressive growth. Do you expect that kind of environment, that that's going to be the new reality for a while? Um, I, look, I think it is possible. Anything is possible. And certainly there are a host of these companies that have very, very dominant positions. Uh, but I do think that we're at a, a political point, uh, a political moment uh, where, you know, the tolerance for, you know, further big company consolidation um, does start to be debated uh, as an antitrust issue in a way that perhaps it hasn't been, uh, quite frankly, for over 40 years since since the Reagan administration. And and look, some of uh, you know government inaction is what's gotten us here, uh, and so you know what may break the logjam may be uh, you know some uh, attempts at re-regulation. Have we done the debt ceiling yet, Bramo? No, Would go for like it. Would you like to do that now? No, go for it. Lisa, please. stick around, please, just for <laughs> 60 seconds. Lisa, the debt ceiling. When clients ask you about this, what are you and the team telling them at the moment? The fundamental thing that we're telling them is, look, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how. Uh, on the question of when, what's critically important from where we sit um, is what will Janet Yellen do after she gets approval um, to extend uh, borrowing? And what we mean by that is at what pace and what duration is she going to issue? Uh, because if you're down to kind of a zero in uh, the Treasury General account, it is very possible that in the you know last four months of of the year, you know she's going to be issuing to the tune of you know 650 to 750 billion dollars, which is a drain of liquidity. At the same time that we may have some of these credit crunch issues where we're continuing to pursue uh, quantitative tightening. So the first thing that we're telling uh, um, clients is beware of the liquidity implications on the other side. Um, the second thing uh, that we're talking about is the how. Um, it 
matters, uh, you know, to forward looking uh, expectations of growth uh, in terms of what uh, is cut. If, if that's what it takes to get a deal done, uh, commitments to cut fiscal spending, what's cut, are there rollbacks of some of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act Act um, spending related uh, opportunities, some of the infrastructure spending uh, that is kind of in motion. And those things have been a support to growth. Uh, and if we need to you know, take that out of the forward forecasts, uh, that is going to dampen uh, economic growth. Lisa, wonderful response. Thank you. Lisa Shannon there of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. In fact, that was fantastic. For people frustrated about talking about the debt ceiling, clip that and just replay it to anyone who asks you about it. The point on growth seems to be so important, it Lisa. It is important. Where is the line on the amount of spending cuts the Democrats would be willing to accept to basically get the Republicans over the line to come to a deal? And will that lead ultimately to slower growth? And the other thing that Lisa mentioned there, all the different cross currents, the conflict there, the debt ceiling, what happens with QT, what's going to happen with growth, the credit crunch potentially of the regional banking issues, None of this is helpful to the cause around growth. No. And I think the fiscal aspect actually is really important because even if they don't want to cut the budget that much, it definitely puts a cap. The fact that there is this debate, this ongoing debate, puts a cap on how quickly uh, spending can be accelerated. The fact that it's such a huge election point, you have to imagine it's going to restrain fiscal spending going forward. That is really negative for growth. So if that's the case... Do you really get this sort of perfect surge in growth the way that Lisa was saying would have to happen in order for prices to really be uh, accurate? And yet they haven't come down. 4 p.m. meeting with congressional leaders and the president of the United States in the Oval Office a little bit later on this afternoon. Up next on this program, Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on today's meeting on the debt ceiling. Looking forward to that conversation in just a moment. Terry's always great from down in Washington, D.C. Up here in New York City, equity futures negative about 0.3% on the S&P 500, trying to bounce in the FX market 109 on the euro against the dollar 109.60, negative 0.4%. Import data out of China, not impressive. Softer growth potentially out of the world's second largest economy relative to the boom hopes of only a few months ago. Yields lower by two basis points, your 10-year, 348. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo senate republican leader mitch mcconnell warns he has no secret plan to solve the debt limit deadlock congressional leaders meet today with president biden mcconnell says he told the president it was up to him and house speaker kevin mccarthy to find a solution at the same time mcconnell predicts the two sides will reach a deal and avoid a default Vladimir Putin vowed to pursue his invasion of Ukraine, accusing the Kremlin's enemies of seeking to dismember Russia. Putin spoke at the start of the annual military parade celebrating the Soviet victory in World War II. He said that a real war has been unleashed against the motherland. And Pakistan former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been detained. The former cricket star faces a number of court cases and was set to be formally indicted Wednesday. Now that has to do with allegations that he did not properly disclose earnings from the sale of his state gifts from his time in office. Khan has called for early elections next year after getting ousted in April 2022 in a no-confidence vote. Aramco will introduce an additional dividend, potentially boosting payouts for Saudi Arabia's government by billions of dollars. Now, it comes at a time when weaker oil prices are pushing the kingdom's budget into a deficit. Aramco says a new dividend will be between 50 to 70 percent of the company's annual free cash flow. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. There needs to be market pressure. Without that market, that market signal, it makes it hard for McCarthy to go to the holdouts who are holding him hostage. 
um, and say it is time to uh, to do a temporary lift of the of the debt ceiling to get us through um, and get us a little bit of space to negotiate between uh, so, so that nobody loses space at the end of this. As Lisa has said all morning, we're playing chicken with the S&P 500 down in Washington, D.C. That was Heidi Kribo Redeker, the senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York City, your equity market. It's not blinking yet. We're negative by 0.3% on the S&P 500. Your bond market isn't either. Yields are lower by just a couple of basis points. Down two basis points to 348. Down about a single basis point on a two-year. Just short of 4%. Let's call it 399 on a two-year yield. In the FX market, the euro against the dollar. Euro dollar, a break of 110. 109.64. We're negative 0.3%. The next stop, of course, on the data front. CPI coming up tomorrow morning, about 24 hours from now. Then on to PPI after that and plenty of fed speak no doubt in between but at 4 p.m eastern time it's a major conversation we've all been waiting for between the president of the united states and congressional leadership including house speaker kevin mccarthy terry haynes of pangea policy the founder joins us now terry you said this we can expect some soothing no default platitudes after the meeting later terry anything else other than that no, I don't think so, John. I mean, I, th I do think you're going to get a little bit of uh, 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 platitude uh, without saying that uh, they will absolutely uh, you know, not default. They'll say they don't want to. None of them want to. Uh, but they'll, then they'll also kind of harden their positions, I think. Uh, you know, Biden's position has always been that, uh, you know, the, the, you can't cut spending at all, really. Uh, that's usually the Democratic going in position. Uh, you can't cut spending on, on, domestic, uh, on domestic discretionary. And uh, and Republicans are going to talk about the need to cut back, in their view, modestly to uh, to fiscal 22 levels. Uh, so, you know, th this gap is bridgeable, but uh, nobody's really interested in bridging it yet. What's the, uh, the sort of over under and how much they want soothing platitudes versus histrionic proclamations that the sky is falling to get the markets interested? Well, you know, if you can do both, that's uh, that's optimal, <laughs> I, I think. Um, yeah, they're trying real hard to get the markets interested, and so far the markets aren't cooperating. And uh, to the extent the markets are cooperating, uh, you know what they're seeing, I think, is uh, is the Republicans having done something, however imperfect, and uh, whereas Biden hasn't done anything, which is why Biden now is 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 bringing everybody into the White House to show that he too is actually interested in doing some sort of a deal, albeit without without. Uh, climbing completely down from the perch that uh, he's not negotiating. You said that there is a 30 percent likelihood of a default. That is the probability yep. that you come up. How do you come up with these probabilities? Um, well, what I how I view this and, and, you know, in fairness, I viewed this as being a 30 to 40 percent likelihood the moment we're in right now uh, since last November. Uh, but Fundamentally, uh, you know, is there a one in three chance that somebody makes a serious mistake here? Yeah, I think so. I think that's not, uh, you know, I think that's more than a trailing risk. And uh, and what what is happening today, I think, will illustrate that because to the extent anybody's looking at uh, this moment and suggesting that there's going to be the beginning of a constructive path here, I think isn't reading the signals properly. Terry, what is the one thing, the one signal, the one thing you can identify? that would make you think that it could be different this time? Well, if, you know, if if I'm wrong on the uh, suggestion that they stick to their uh, spending, uh, the, the kind of their spending guns and say, you know, we're going to sit down over a period of time and work this out uh, and give markets some reassurance that not only will the problem be solved, but it will be solved, you know, on a, but, you know, by on a, or on a particular date, uh, you know that you know that I'm wrong, uh, but that's that's not at all what I'm seeing or hearing. On the X date, we've heard as early as possibly early June. Terry, what's your read on that? How conservative do you think the Treasury Secretary needs to be about the so-called X date? How much more padding? Well, Weeks, months? What would she do? Uh, well, I think she needs to be as. Uh, as transparent as possible, first of all. Second of all, I think she needs to avoid the mistakes that some some prior Treasury secretaries have made of both parties, frankly, uh, where they uh, where they surprise policymakers, whether it be uh, surprise your own president or surprise uh, Congress. Uh, there's going to be enough volatility 
in the negotiations here without adding to it the volatility of a Treasury secretary kind of hiding the ball till the last minute. I mean, she needs to be uh, putting as many cards on the table as possible, frankly, because then not only will that help negotiations, uh, that'll help markets. Terry, this is kind of related, but earlier this morning, John was talking about how Jay Powell faces the lowest confidence and the lowest uh, backing from the public in history. This, according to a Gallup poll, and this poll also had uh, the lowest confidence. If you take a look at all the politicians, whether it's a Republican or Democratic Party, pretty much across the board, as they looked at what's going on with the debt ceiling debate, is what they look at what they see as, as just sort of general dysfunction. How much has this become something that has been entrenched and basically just an accepted fact that there is a lack of confidence in public officials in Washington, D.C.? Um, I think it's quite entrenched. It's, uh, you know, I. I for a long time, frankly. Uh, what I found interesting about the Gallup poll, by the way, is that if you combine the, uh, all these numbers are pretty tight, by the way, but if you, you combine the, uh, the kind of high to low confidence numbers, uh, House Republican leaders come out be the best, but not by much, uh, then Yellen, then Powell, and the Democrats, Yellen, Powell, but uh, Biden comes out the least. And uh, you know that's not a good uh, th that's not a good sign either. But what it ought to tell the White House is that there's an opportunity here uh, to you know frankly enhance the president's own standing uh, if he takes leadership on a deal. Interesting, Terry. Wonderful perspective. You know I enjoy catching up with you always, Terry Haynes there of Pangea Policy. Lisa mentioning some of the polls more broadly. You're right, Lisa. It's not just the Fed chair, Jay Powell. It's pretty much everyone down in Washington, D.C. And there is a number for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, 37 percent. So that's the lowest for any Treasury Secretary going back to Jack Lew. Jack Lew was at 20 percent in 2014. I mean, that sounds absolutely savage, doesn't it? it 20 percent. <laughs> yes, it wasn't exactly um, encouraging. Was he the one with a lot of circles? The squiggle. Yeah. The squiggle. Thanks. The terrible signature. I mean, yeah, I, actually, it, I never I understood it. I actually think it's better than mine, but I mean, it's sort of it's very if you're going to sign bills, I mean, come on. Like, I mean, like, it, it just was just, a lot of like zeros next to each it. other. I just... But maybe that was his practiced one. Maybe he wanted it to be the squiggle. I don't know. Anyway, that maybe was why he had undermined confidence. I do think it's an important issue, though, especially at a time when people are sort of rolling their eyes at this and saying, really, another debt ceiling debate? And I think that that really speaks to the lack of confidence that people have in Washington, D.C. Hardly a ringing endorsement of Congress. 38% of Americans have confidence in congressional Republicans on the economy compared to 34% for congressional Democrats. I mean, it's that's like lose lose across the board. Pretty much, that's exactly what we're looking for, and it's sort of a competition for who can lose least. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement. Of Sums the up Washington DC, doesn't it? You know? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I might sum up this system. meeting a little bit later on this afternoon. <laughs> well, yeah, that's sort of what we're going to see is a lot of posturing after the fact, and you know, ah, there's no winners here. There's winners here, that's for sure. Around this table, Brown, <laughs> yeah, you're a winner. Coming up at the open on Bloomberg TV. This is what it looks like. Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management, Chris Mamani of Lafayette College, Aaron Cannon of Clear Harbour Asset Management, and, drumroll, we'll catch up with Henrietta Trace of Vader Partners. Very Looking forward cool. to catching up with Henrietta around this debt ceiling nonsense, Lisa, going into this meeting a little bit later this afternoon. Very cool. It'll be very cool uh, to hear what she has to say. I also do wonder, with the politics of the moment, the fact that we are seeing this shift with big companies doing a lot better than smaller companies and whether anyone addresses that. I was just looking at a story that big bank bonuses jumped 20% at regionals, people are getting paid that much less. And I'm watching this and I'm just thinking to myself, how are they gonna keep employees? But this is just something that's going on more broadly. Smaller companies are losing out to bigger companies in a massive way. And this is gonna become a massive political issue as well. It's a stock market issue. Lisa yeah, Shannon said it about 20 minutes ago. Small caps, terrible, weighted towards the financials. Big caps, large caps, mega caps, S&P 500, weighted towards tech is holding up nicely. But this, to me, raises a question. If you're an employee, you're going to get paid more to big company. They're going to be able to withstand pricing pressure, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. It's just it's an interesting moment for an economy that relies on the small businesses. And they have more political voice as well. And you can contribute to that wonderful culture that exists at large companies, you know? Mm -hmm. You're in a rare mood today. <laughs> it's it's yeah, been lovely. Have you not heard about that? No, what? All the big banks, the they culture? want you to come to work to contribute to the culture. You love the on culture, Wall Street. don't you? I think it's so important. You wear a flag, It's hat, so important scarf. to contribute to the culture and be part of the family. <laughs> so, so important. Until you kicked out. From New York. Disgracing the family. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Well,
Welcome back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz. Tom off. He will be back tomorrow. John, on to his next thing. And uh, here with me is Neil Dutton. We'll get to him in one second. In the markets, you are seeing a softer tone after, I guess, yesterday's sleuth data, the senior loan officer opinion survey. However, to give narrative to this is uh, really difficult on any given day. Interesting that we also got that uh, optimism, small business optimism survey that came out earlier this morning that was disappointing. We are seeing a bit of a bid into treasuries yields lower 3.49 percent on a 10-year a bit of dollar strength euro weakness 109.62 crude softer and this has been really a trend we have just seen that incredible weakness as people gauge out what recession means even if they're perhaps not seeing it in some of the fundamental data tomorrow we do get cpi data where we're going to be taking a look at inflation do we have to start being worried about inflation again and the prospect for the fed hiking rates further or are we going to see some sort of softening and then on to ppi a real question underpinning a market especially as we get small businesses showing signs of stress and big businesses reporting better than expected earnings and a consumer very much willing to spend. Putting these two things together, one of my favorite economists ever, Neil Dutta, joining us now. I always love hashing this through with you. He's head of U.S. economic research at Renaissance Macro. I want to start there. What's going to win here? The consumers who keep spending and now are borrowing or companies that are pulling back spending and being more conservative? No, I think the consumers will win. Historically, the causality goes from consumers to businesses, right? So um, I think the, uh, the issue is that, you know, companies have been preparing now for several quarters for a recession that hasn't yet arrived. And I think they're moving further away, um, you know, they're further off sides on growth. And, you know, if the consumer continues to hang in there, there may be a period of catch-up that happens where they have to restock their inventories, maybe adjust their CapEx budgets. Uh, maybe hire a bit more, post more openings. So I, I, I definitely, um, you know, I mean, to me, it's also, Lisa, as you know, it's really about what is the consensus pricing in and then what is the likely outcome, do, you know, going to be? And then you try to pick your battles as wisely as you can. And, you know, to me, the consensus right now is expecting a recession to start really in this quarter. I mean, June, Q3. I mean, the, the Bloomberg News consensus, I think, is for flat growth in each of the next two quarters. And, I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't seem like that's going to happen. We had a strong auto sales number for April. We had, it looks like core retail sales will, will come in stronger for April. We know from the public builders that April was a very strong month for, for new home sales. So, you know, I mean. The, okay. Taking a step back, mm -hmm. let's tease this, tease this out a little bit. Okay. You said when you're talking about uh, how the consensus Right. Is the consensus of a survey of economists or is the consensus what's priced into stock valuations? Because they're two different things and they haven't been agreeing with each other. Well, look, I mean, the bond market's also out there pricing in rate cuts. Um, and I think, what, like 200 basis points worth of cuts between now and the end of next year? I mean, that's uh, hard to see in the context of a strong economy, right? So, Or even an economy that's treading water. I mean, people clearly expect some weakness in the economy. I think... You know, with respect to equities, I mean, equities are still well off the highs, obviously. I mean, we've seen some rally of late. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think you can make a case to say that the, the outlook for stocks is somewhat ambiguous, right? I mean, if, if recession risk gets priced out, that should be good for earnings. But at the same time, that probably leaves the Fed, the prospect of the Fed, uh, you know, uh, f future right hikes uh, still on the table, which could, could weigh on stocks. What would we have to see tomorrow? for the CPI report to shock this market, to say, wait a second, we have to start thinking about the Fed staying at 5%, possibly going up to 550, more than rate cuts, which are being significantly priced in. Well, I mean, I, th I, I do think that there's scope for some upside surprises on inflation. The question is whether the Fed is going to lean into that by continuing to hike over the summer. I don't think they will. I think that they probably take a pause. Um, you know, we have, you know, essentially... A, they're captured to some extent by events, right? I mean, the regional banking issues, obviously, there's still an issue there. Um, we also have the debt limit negotiations. So there are things out there that they can point to um, to kind of keep them away from hiking over the summer. But ultimately, I think if the inflation numbers stay relatively firm, if the economy is still holding up, we're clearly not growing below trend, right? The unemployment rate is not going to rise as much as the Fed expects, right? I mean, we're at 3.4%. The Fed's looking for a percentage point increase between now and the end of the year. I don't really see anything 
uh, in the outlook that justifies that kind of a move. So you could be well coming back in September talking about maybe they're revising down their unemployment forecast, maybe they're taking up GDP, uh, and that could um, you know push them towards hiking again. It's difficult to know what's going to happen in the future. It's incredibly difficult to even know what's happening right now because the signals are muddied. And perhaps you disagree. I'd love the argument. But I do uh, see that, for example, the senior loan officer survey, to me, even though perhaps nothing was that surprising with credit tightening, we did see a huge drop off in demand. Again, the C-suite confidence factor, not there or else not willing to pay for the credit. And when you look at optimism among business executives, and anecdotally, they say we are very concerned about what's coming down the pike, about inflation, about how much we have to pay our workers, about our squeezed margins. So how do you pair these ideas with the strength that we're seeing in the overall kind of numbers that we're getting out of these uh, sort of regular surveys? I mean, CEO confidence and business confidence more generally has been quite sluggish pretty much since last June. And companies have been slowly cutting back CapEx. Inventories have been a significant drag on growth over the last year. So, um, and consumers have been, you know, their confidence has been pretty weak also. But ultimately, um, to me, it's what are they actually doing? Companies are still hiring people, right? I mean, this, you know, these depressed uh, businesses, they're still going out and hiring 200,000 people a month. Every month, if you know, for the last three months, um, if you, I mean, the hiring rate is basically stable at around four um, percent. You know, you see, you you haven't really seen right. So there, there, there's a disconnect between how people say they may feel about things, but what they're actually going out and doing. And I'm more concerned about what people are actually doing. Although you did see that businesses are not engaging in mergers and acquisitions. They're not doing capital expenditures, which directly goes into economic uh, trajectory. They're not pulling the deal on, uh, pulling the trigger on things, right? Which has been one of the things, the reason. Well, some you things will get clipped, Lisa, in a higher interest rate environment like M&A. But, you know, I mean, you talk about CapEx, I mean, Talk to, I mean, Boeing orders are going up, right? Boeing production is going to go up. That's going to be a huge tailwind for transportation equipment, right? I mean, that, that, those are capital goods. Those are big ticket purchases. So, um, but again, it's not that the economy has to be booming here, right? So there's this sort of, um, there's this expectation that, oh, you know, GDP needs to be like 3%. No, it doesn't. I mean, the, the issue is, where's the consensus thinking it's going to be, okay. right? And to me, look, the Fed's forecast is 0. 4% Q4, Q4 this year, that's highly unlikely, um, just given what we have on hand for the, for the second quarter. We're lo talking about the short term or mm -hmm. the relatively near term in terms of growth uh, continuing. Longer term, there is this question of whether we're bringing forward growth, especially in light of what everyone loves to talk about, the debt ceiling debate, which we've been talking about all morning, and this question of whether they're going to be cutting spending going forward. How do you sort of pair the short term versus the long term, the short term optimism in ongoing strength in the economy mm -hmm. versus long term, perhaps sluggishness? Yeah, I mean, I think so, right. I mean, that's. <clears throat> I think uh, my primary, I guess, um, disagreement with the consensus is really over the timing, right? I mean, I don't see a recession as imminent. I don't see one uh, as likely at any point in the next, you know, let's say 12 months. But the Fed has told us that they believe a period of below-trend growth is required to quell the inflation issue. So that's where the caution comes from. So I think if you want to be honest with yourself, um, you know, ultimately, there's going to be some kind of economic slump that's out there that that the Fed will try to engineer to bring inflation back towards its target. Uh, if you if you really believe in the soft landing at this point, you you need to be hanging your hat on on two things. Uh, number one, some kind of a productivity boom that brings unit labor costs down, um, or um, you know the Fed basically accepts a higher rate of inflation. And I don't see either as uh, as a baseline expectation going forward. So um, again, it's, it's about the momentum in the economy right now. To me, that doesn't speak to a recession. Um, but as I said, the Fed still believes that below trend growth is required to quell the inflation issue. So to me, that, that, that leaves, you know, you have to kind of stay cautious. I mean, I know it's not, it's not, it's sort of a, um, it's a difficult environment, I think, for, for investors, because uh, it's hard to be sort of sustainable, sustainably optimistic on, on equities here, right? So I, I think that, that that's part of the, the frustration. Just before you go, I would love your thoughts on the debt ceiling and what we're seeing and the excitement 
that you expect in markets as a response? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's sort of a bit, I mean, I think we're going through a, a, a very public and open negotiation from both sides politically, um, whether the deadline's actually June 1st or not. Um, I think uh, the House Republicans have done what they needed to do. I think the administration is doing what they need to do. And I think ultimately there'll be some sort of negotiation that, that, um, that resolves the issue. I mean, to me, it's a, bin a binary thing, right? I mean, you either go over the, the cliff or not. I suspect they won't. Um, and if they do get to a point where they're prioritizing payments, I mean, that'll be an opportunity to be buying bonds because, I mean, basically, you're, you're basically forcing a recession on the economy over so, the summer at that point. So you don't think longer term, and this is where I wanted to go, that this will reduce the U.S.'s abil ability to borrow cheaply and the ability for the dollar to be used globally in sort of the uh, what's the alternative it's, what's the alternative no I don't I don't I mean this is just I mean to me it's 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 political rankering we'll see we'll see what happens but I I, I I I don't I don't really subscribe to those ideas so is this basically the most fun time you've ever had as an economist uh, no the most fun time actually was when the, the job was a lot easier um, in the period immediately following the financial crisis right I mean because back then it was Everyone was looking for a recession literally every, you know, it's around the corner two years away, and it was never it was never really in the cards for that entire cycle. And pushing back on that was actually quite easy, and the data easily bore that out. Now it's actually quite challenging because there are so many mixed signals, and I prefer a much easier job than not. So. <laughs> I think a lot of people would agree with you, Neil Zada. <laughs> thank you so much. At Renaissance Macro Research, we really appreciate it, really uh, highlighting some of the uncertainties as we parse through the push and pull of different aspects of the economy, suffering through very different cycles or experiencing uh, the upturn of consumer spending. They continue to fly. They fly a lot, which is what we're going to be talking about next. Helene Becker of Cowan will be joining us to talk about the airline industry and how much people are continuing to uh, go there in markets who are seeing softness here as we uh, head into the trading session, led in part by some of those regional banks, some of those areas that have been beaten up as people try to tease out the next potential catalyst. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says that if Congress fails to raise a debt ceiling, it would have an adverse impact on the use of the dollar worldwide and would be an economic catastrophe for the nation. She told CNBC that the government would also need to figure out, quote, what to do with the resources that we do have. President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders today about the debt ceiling. The public's not showing much confidence in Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. According to a new Gallup poll, 36 percent of U.S. adults say they have a great deal or a fair amount of confidence that Powell would do or recommend the right thing for the economy. That's the lowest level recorded since Gallup began tracking public confidence in the Fed chair in 2001. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell predicts that Congress will keep funding Ukraine's defense. That's despite growing calls from some members of his own party to reduce or end the aid. McConnell has called on President Biden to speed up shipments of high-tech weapons to Ukraine. A big acquisition in the mattress business. Temper Sealy has agreed to buy a controlling stake in Mattress Firm in a cash and stock deal valued at about $4 billion. Mattress Firm has more than 2,400 stores across 49 states in the U.S. It's owned by South Africa-based Steinhoff International Holdings. And Under Armour keeps struggling in its turnaround effort. The athletic gear maker fell after its full-year earnings missed estimates. Under Armour warned in February that a buildup in inventory would lead to more promotions across the category and recovery would take longer than expected. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. You are going to see an increase in anxiety as the balances run low. And, uh, you know, if there's a, an accidental default, you will see a drop in stock prices, a drop in yields, and a widening of credit spreads. I think 12 to 24 months from now, this is not going to be a major economic event. It could, though, in the short term, be very jarring for the markets.
In the game of chicken, we have the markets basically saying you're not going to default, and uh, Washington is saying, please, get more concerned. Robert Tipp there weighing in, chief investment strategist and head of global bonds at PGM Fixed Income, talking about how the initial response will be to buy bonds. This amid a backdrop of otherwise more resilience than people had expected, particularly when it comes to consumer discretionary spending, and no area defines that more than airlines and travel. And after the bell, we get Airbnb and Wynn Resorts and some of these other consumer discretionary travel-related shares, which have popped immensely so far this year. There is a big question underpinning, particularly air travel, which is how long can prices keep surging well beyond where regular inflation is? And just to give you a sense, in February, year-over-year -year inflation came in at 27.4 percent for air flights uh, just year-over-year. -year. That is incredible. That is more than twice the rate of inflation anywhere. Helene Becker joins us now to talk about how long it's going to continue, whether margins just keep expanding. And when we start to get some of the pushback that we heard from the likes of President Biden himself yesterday, Helene Becker, senior research analyst at Cowan. So let's just start there. Why has it been that consumers are not pushing back more to these incredible price increases? Well, I think there are two reasons, Lisa. The first is that a year ago in the first quarter, there was still Omicron. So that was one issue. And then the second issue um, had a, has a lot to do with summer travel, especially international travel. Because remember, a year ago, the US didn't remove restrictions until June 11th. And um, a lot of people had already, most summer trips are planned between mid-May and mid-March, actually the other way around, right? March and May. And they um, had already decided where they were going. And a lot of stuff wasn't open yet. So now everything is open. People are tired of being home. They want to travel. Um, they feel like they've missed out on a lot. And they're, and they're going. And you have huge, huge demand. We're, we're about equal to where we were in 2019. Um, but we have 20, between 10 and 20% fewer seats available. And the result is that with demand, even with business travel and international not being 100% back, with demand being so strong and exceeding supply, airlines are pushing up fares and will continue to do so until there's significant pushback. And you're not seeing any significant pushback so far? I'm not seeing it in the summer months, for sure. Um, I, I'm a little worried about once we get past Labor Day, in general, because we normally see a dip, but also um, I'm a little worried because I think by then people may be um, exhausted by the prices. And of course, we don't think this summer is going to be significantly better than last summer, especially in the New York area where um, we have a decided lack of air traffic controllers and the government asked the airlines if they would help by um, reducing capacity in the market. Um, and most of the airlines who are operating now have employment that exceeds their pre-pandemic levels. So the airlines were ready. The government is not. How much are we looking at a real divergence between the international airlines versus the more domestic airlines? And I ask, uh, with also a focus on first class, which is commanding the biggest premium in years relative to uh, economy, how much is really the gains that we have seen entirely driven by that international flight path, the traveler that has that much more discretionary spending? So, so Lisa, we're seeing international outbound very strong from the US, I think because the dollar has been relatively strong. Inbound, we're still down versus where we were, um, but outbound, we're above. So I think that's one thing. I, I think the other part of your question with respect to how how the divergence between the two, um, you know, I think that's definitely a summer 20. 23 event, maybe into 24 when you get to Asia Pacific, which is re reopening now. Um, and then domestic, I don't know, maybe people will be so overwhelmed by the price of some tickets that they'll pivot and either shift days that they travel or shift location instead of going to Europe because fares are so high, maybe go to Latin America, Northern South America, domestic. I think you'll see some of that pivoting um, because of the differential in fares. Do you think that there's going to be some sort of decline in business travel or is it coming back nearly to the level that it was pre-pandemic or even more because people are just working from home and then traveling? 
Right. Um, so I don't know the specific answer to that question because my thought has been that business travel will come back in, in differing measures. So you need to see your clients after a while. Zoom calls don't cut it, number one. Number two, when you get to time zone differences, it's one thing to be U.S. East Coast to um, London or Western Europe where you're dealing with a five or six hour time change. You can kind of make that work. But when you start to get into the nine hour time changes that exist in the Middle East or 15 hours or 12 hours that exist to Asia, um, Australia, Japan, um, I think people realize it's hard to do Zoom calls at one o'clock in the morning um, for somebody while they're doing these 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 calls. So I think at some point it does start to come back. We've thought that it would be international business would be would come back faster than domestic. But I think the days of if it's Tuesday, it must be Rome kind of thing um, are past us. And and to the extent you might have a a meeting that would be three hours long, you can probably get away with a one hour or or two one hour Zoom calls, um, not necessarily back to back. But I remember days when I flew to London for due diligence and flew home the next, you know, the same day, land in the morning, fly home at night. I mean, that kind of stuff isn't happening anymore. How much are we seeing actually the resurgence of the Chinese economy percolate into air travel? Yeah, not yet. Um, so what you're seeing is what we experienced in the U.S., um, you see domestic first. So Golden Week, as I understand it, was fairly strong. We should get the numbers tonight or tomorrow. Um, but last week was 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 a very strong week for them. Domestic. International hasn't come back yet because the flights haven't come back. In 2016, there were over 100 flights a week between the U.S. and China and more between China and Europe. And now there are 14 between the U.S. and China. So flights haven't come back yet. And until that happens, which was probably a 24 event at the earliest, given the political situation, maybe even later, um, I don't think you're going to see that that dynamic come back from a tourist perspective. I think what you'll see and what you're probably seeing right now is family travel, people who haven't seen family in a couple of years because of the Chinese COVID policy, which had the country virtually shut down. Yeah. Um, I think you see students making their way back home who who maybe were were trapped outside of China. But I think it's domestic is where you're seeing the strength versus international. Just real quick here, we see oil prices coming down, which means that a lot of the, uh, the margins probably will only expand. At what point do the widening margins become a political liability for some of the airline companies that are facing a lot of criticisms about the experience? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Lisa. So so I think a couple of things. Um, fuel prices come down. Typically, ticket prices follow with something like a three to four month lag in both directions. So I think that's one thing to think about. Oil prices come down. If oil prices are coming down because we're in a recession, that should bring ticket prices down as well, maybe take some of the pressure off the airlines. The airlines do a really good job this summer, probably remove some political pressure. Um, I mean, the airlines are one of those industries everybody loves to hate. And even though it brings people together, even though to have a good economy, you need a robust airline industry, um, it's one of those industries everybody likes to pick on. And um, so so they really need to do a better job than they're doing. And I think you'll, I, I mean, I guess we're kind of hoping, although that's not a strategy. Um, I think we're, we're thinking that as they invest in technology, um, things will start to improve for them but the, certainly the lack of seats is a problem um, in terms of recovery from irregular operations. So lot, kind of a lot to unpack there, Lisa. You asked a great question. <laughs> well, thanks. Elaine Becker of Cowan, thank you. And I ask us, of course, as President Biden had a meeting yesterday talking about uh, the demand to pay for hotel rooms and compensate people for delays and uh, cancellations. Elaine Becker, thank you so much. Coming up on Bloomberg Markets, Stephanie Buj uh, Bunaj, uh, chairman of Euronext, as we parse through the next potential catalyst in a market that has been really stuck in a range assessing all of the potential uh, ramifications of the emergence from a pandemic and an inflationary shock unlike what we have seen in 40 years. We're seeing bond yields basically unchanged on the two-year. Keep talking about sort of the stasis that we're seeing, and we're seeing S&P futures down about four-tenths of a percent. This uh, is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen will be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.